All right. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Scott. Uh, my friend John Pounder is up there on the far right, and our guest tonight. John and I are going to kind of co-host this on his and my channel. It should be streaming to his channel as well. And we have uh, Tim Cohen with us. Tim wrote a book that I had never heard about called Antichrist and a Cup of Tea. He wrote it back, I believe, in 1998. And it wasn't until I saw a video, uh, a YouTube video that he had done on the Commonwealth Games um, from 2022 that I'd ever even heard of this before. I, and what, what got me intrigued to bring John on and do this, uh, myself and Doug Hamp had had Tim Cohen on, um, on our Prophecy Roundtable show that I co-host on his channel. And then I had heard, it's probably been about four or five weeks ago, John, that you guys were not even talking about the subject, but, but, or maybe you were actually, and, and you mentioned Tim's book that you had read it. Uh, you just told me David had had a copy of it and, you know, David's probably got a library that would fill up five rooms. Yeah, uh, man. Well, well, that's how that's originally. So this is, I was researching a topic kind of, I wouldn't say unrelated cause it was unrelated and, um, it wasn't a hundred percent unrelated. It was related to the lineage of, definitely of the beast right it was definitely related to that and through several books that i had read by lawrence gardner i'm not i'm not sure if you guys are familiar familiar with lawrence gardner but he was a 33rd degree freemason uh director of scottish antiquities and he wrote several books about lineages he was also uh one of the um genealogists of these royal families and you see all the royal families through all these books kind of funnel all the way down, all the way down into our present kingship today, the kingship of Wales. And I was actually doing a study on Attila the Hun, uh, tracing Attila the Hun's lineage. And uh, I, it traced me, oddly enough, to the idea that it's possibly that Attila the Hun was, um, um, excuse me, Ar King Arthur. And so, like, they had the same, had same look, same achievements all of these different things. And I started looking into that King Arthur and his achievements as, as a, as a till the Huns achievements. And they were, they were really similar and, and really started running into a block with the uh, dark ages and, and some of the history that's presented. Cause a lot of it's just metaphorical stuff. And so eventually that led me to an interview that I saw with Tim Cohen uh, with, I don't even know the name of the broadcasters. I've never seen them before in my life. Haven't seen them since, but I, watched the interview and I was like, man, this is super compelling and super interesting. And then so I, I asked David, I said, have you ever heard of a guy named Tim Cohen? He wrote a book called Antichrist and the Cup of Tea. He's like, oh, yeah, I have the I have that book in my library. I'm like, oh. I'm like, OK, well, now we're talking. I was like, can I borrow that book? So I borrowed it, read through it and a few. It took me a couple of days and I read all the way through it and I just thoroughly intrigued. So I'm excited to be doing this, uh, Tim. And also thank you, Scott, for uh, let me jump on here with you, man. Well, I appreciate it. And Tim, uh, uh, John and I talked, me and you have talked, it's the first time y'all have actually been on screen together, but it was sort of like what we talked about, uh, going to kind of let you share screen and do a presentation. And John and I are probably, for the most part, just going to sit back and maybe ask questions. So Okay, sounds great. So we had tested this out earlier, so when you're ready to share your screen and start, we'll let you get rolling. All right, tell me if you're not seeing anything I'm talking about. Not yet. I'm going to give a little intro to my background and the okay. site, what's on it, and and then we'll jump into initially the Antichrist and a cup of tea. So hopefully this won't be some weird screen effect, but we'll find out. Yeah, we tested this earlier today, y'all. So maybe yeah. <laughs> yeah. And while you're looking for it, while you're looking for it, I just want to All say right. um, to those of you who are, are streaming uh, this out here. Um, Give yourself an open mind on this topic, first off, please, because it sounds completely crazy. You could think, how can anybody in the world like King Charles or think that he would be even remotely a great consideration for this and all the things I thought. But you need to just forget what you heard for a little bit. You know, as you guys all know that I've said this many, many times, the powers that be have a job and that's deception. Right. In the end times, we know there's going to be a great deception. So we need to have an open eye an open ear here and just check it out. See for yourself. If you don't like it, throw it out. But listen, uh, they're not everything, not everything you're going to agree with, with Tim. And 
Uh, not everything that I'm going to agree with with Scott or any of these guys, but uh, there's always things to be learned, even if you don't fully 100% agree with every idea of eschatology that's being taught, because eschatology can kind of be all over the place depending on who you talk to. So uh, I just wanted to throw that disclaimer out there since we are streaming cool. it on Now You See TV as well. Yeah. And real quick, and Tim, Tim does this. I've told him I'm not fully on board with this. Uh, when 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 we had him on uh, the roundtable, uh, Doug was more skeptical than I. But uh, you know, he makes a compelling case. So anybody that's really really skeptical, just listen. Uh, he does make a very compelling case. Uh, I'm not ready to put uh, to put uh, Charles King Charles the Third. I told him I wouldn't call him Chucky tonight, but King Charles, I, I'm not going to put him as the Antichrist until I see it. But Tim makes a good case, so everybody have an open mind. So Tim, whenever you're ready, man. Yeah, and of course I'm not the one to tiptoe through the tulips, so I'll be very clear about what I'm saying with everyone. But I don't expect everyone to just accept it without seeing the evidence. So. But thank you both for having me on, and uh, let's dive into it. So my publisher is ProphecyOS.com. Uh, the Antichrist and the Cup of Tea was published in 1998. I began it in 1987. At the same time, I began another series. It's called uh, Messiah History and the Tribulation Period, this thing here, seven volumes. This will be one of the last things that I put out, probably coming out toward the end of next year, my magnum opus. And this covers almost the entire Bible, and uh, originally... The Antichrist and the Cup of Tea, the book, was an appendix to that series, but it became too large, became its own work in its own right. So I've been working on books, writing for a long time, started when I was a cadet at the Air Force Academy, and then uh, God called me to do this. And uh, I have many other things coming. So there's a series coming on so-called aliens titled Solar Apocalypse, which I will be giving not the regurgitated stuff that everyone has heard, but actual hard evidence on what exists in our solar system, the actual history that occurred uh, from the fall of Adam and Eve uh, until this day. And eyewitness testimony where I've uh, got firsthand accounts of different things in this, including showing actual creatures and fossils on Mars, the moon, and other bodies in our solar system that upend the evidence I share in here on comets and asteroids upends modern macroevolutionary cosmogony or the idea that the universe is old or even that our solar system is billions of years old. This proves that all the models that exist out there among evolutionists for the development of our solar system over billions of years are literally impossible. I destroy it all in one false swoop with a series with hard evidence that nobody will be able to gainsay. And it comes from multiple space agencies officially sourced. So not like anything you can find in any other source in the world. And uh, then my Messiah during the Tribulation Period series I mentioned, there's this book, North Korea, Iran, and the Coming World War, uh, which is out. That deals with the second seal of the apocalypse, Behold a Red Horse. And I'm suggesting that uh, that has to do with North Korea and Iran, and then ultimately Russia and China, the United States, NATO, uh, Japan, South Korea, et cetera, probably India and Pakistan, but that's all addressed in this book. This was published in 2018, and I'll mention John and Scott, you probably heard this before, but uh, I also cover the invasion of Ukraine in this book before it happened. So what comes next, what hasn't happened yet, is also in this book. So that has to do with the second seal of the apocalypse. The Antichrist and Cup of Tea, when we get into it, deals with the fourth seal of the apocalypse, the fourth horseman. Uh, and a little bit with the first three seals, but primarily the fourth horseman. So I'll give more information on that later. There are a lot of books that aren't mentioned on this site yet, um, some of which are coming late this year, early next year time frame. So there's a separate book on the Mark of the Beast, a separate book on the depopulation agenda that also deals with um, some other aspects of it besides biological warfare. There are many aspects to it, so that book covers pretty much all of it. There's a book uh, titled The Last Day's Polemic that's coming. Um, and a book on the exodus from ancient Egypt that is just briefly mentioned here. Um, and it'll probably be retitled when it comes out, but uh, it's mentioned right down here for those who want to see it. In this book, I actually identify who the, the, uh, the pharaohs were 
you know, who were involved in ancient Israel's history, including who Moses' adoptive mother was, who his Pharaoh was, who Joseph was in Egypt and who his Pharaoh was. And then I think I've identified all of those Pharaohs with the possible exception of one with concrete evidence in this book. And that one, I think I probably nailed it, but I'm not entirely sure. So the dates, all of that's in here. And this is meant to show Israel, particularly today, that the historicity of the Exodus and thus the promises to the promised land are in fact real. Many Israelites today, those who are in Israel, um, including most of the archeologists in Israel, despite finding things that they know are in scripture, reject the historicity of the Exodus and the promises of land to Israel. So I wrote this book for this purpose, but it gives more information on the topic for Christians as well than uh, has ever been put in one book before and has ever been put together in a testable way before. So that's in that. And uh, there's more on here, but I won't go into it. I'll just let people go to the site and see there'll be more of these books that are mentioned on the site as time progresses. So that ultimately I'll have about 40 books out within uh, three years or so, I think, including the three multi-volume series. Cool. Hey, Tim, let's let's get yep. to the, the yep. book. That, Dive what what led now. you to write the... Mm -hmm. What led you to write, uh, I guess, that was this your first book that you actually published, The Antichrist and the Cup of Tea? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I started and, it in 1987 while yeah. I was still at the Air Force Academy as a cadet, and the first edition was put out in 1998. Yeah, briefly, uh, tell us a little bit about how you even got on this on this track, because it, it's, it's an interesting story. I've heard the interviews, but if you can maybe give us a five minute synopsis about what in the world you were doing as a young man that even put you on this line to even study what I would call coat of arms, but which uh, you now call it, which properly called heraldry. And, and then, so we'll, we'll kind of get into what you're showing right here, the heraldry of uh, what was then uh, Prince, Prince Charles of Wales. Yeah. So I was raised a secular Jew. Uh, on my mother's side of the family, that whole side of the family came out of Egypt during the 1956 Suez Canal conflict. They were wealthy, uh, a wealthy family in Egypt, and the Egyptian government confiscated everything in that conflict with uh, between Egypt and Israel. Yeah, they got out basically with the clothes on their backs. So my family went through Europe, and then my particular portion settled uh, actually in Colorado in the United States. So I was born here myself. But um, I ended up attending the same high school that my mother went to when it was a brand new school, even though we'd moved around the country, you know, back and forth prior to that when my dad was finishing his doctoral dissertation when I was a young child. And uh, then uh, I ended up attending the Air Force Academy later after I'd said when I was 12 years old, before I was a Christian or a believer or, you know, anything other than just basically secular or pagan. I'd said I was going to attend the Air Force Academy at the age of 12, and that's what ended up happening later on in a kind of surprising, shocking turn of events, the way that worked out. But I was at the Academy, uh, a secular, unbelieving Jew, having had some New Age background through my dad and my stepmother and other influences, being interested in tarot cards, thinking there might be something to it, you know, and psychics and all this kind of thing. And I had a classmate who invited me to go to a Bible study. Uh, over a summer break, and I thought, hmm. And I said, what's it about? And his response was prophecy, and I said, oh, I didn't know there was prophecy in the Bible. So he had a hook right there. I was a little bit interested, and I'd been somewhat interested prior to that because I'd heard of Hal Lindsey and his book, uh, Late Great Planet Earth, and had my stepfather, who was you know, an ostensible Christian, get the book for me when I was 14, and I never read it. You know, He got me the screw tape letters. I never read it. When I was 16, I started to read the uh, King James Version translation authorized king james version translation of matthew because i'd asked my stepmother to buy me a bible which she did she got me a king james version i was out sunbathing in the backyard in the summer and uh i turned it to the beginning of matthew and i got into the lineages just started and i thought man this is way too obscure for me slammed it shut went under the house and that's where it stayed until years later so here i am at the academy you know i'm invited to go to a bible study i decided to go and over a period of weeks I didn't hear a ton about prophecy, but what I did finally hear was um, about the Messiah as a guilt offering in Isaiah 53 and Hashem. Yeah, and God just opened my heart, and I believed at that point. So I, and there's all backstory to that and, and, and different things that happened, but I felt the Holy Spirit enter me 
uh, uniquely. I haven't heard anybody else say that, but I physically felt it. Yeah, when I went back to my dorm room, not owning a Bible at that point, other than the one you know under the house uh, back home, uh, I started to do all the same things that I had been doing, but I was, uh, my conscience was pricking me on things without knowing why. But I did ask the pastor to buy me a Bible. He got me a Schofield reference Bible. Or excuse me, a Thompson Chain Bible is what he got me that. I got the Schofield later. But um, began to read that fairly voraciously once I had it. And I got through the New Testament uh, at least once and through the book of Revelation two or three times. And then through a good chunk of the Old Testament. And at that point, when I was reading Revelation again, and I got to the 13th chapter of Revelation, let me just uh, bring that up for a moment here. And I was standing outside, literally, and I was thinking about this. You know, I was walking around reading my pocket New Testament. And I was thinking about this, and I thought, okay, that's a pretty bizarre imagery here in this chapter, right? Not obscure in the same way as Matthew's lineages seemed to me to be, you know, a number of years earlier, but strange imagery. So I read this imagery here about a beast, you know, rising out of the sea, having seven heads, ten horns, yada, yada. And then, you know, it's like a leopard, feet like the feet of a bear, mouth like the mouth of a lion. Then this dragon gives him his power, throne, and great authority, right? And we know from the prior chapter, uh, Revelation 12, that that is a fiery red dragon. Yeah, it's right here. A great fiery red dragon. And that dragon is identified explicitly in this same chapter as the serpent who deceived Eve in the Garden of Eden and as Satan himself. So, you know, called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. Um, this dragon. So we got a fiery red dragon that gives this beast his power, throne, and great authority. So I'm asking God, okay, what is this? That doesn't exist in nature so far as I know. And I'm thinking, okay, it could be a chimeric hybrid, maybe, you know, or something else down the road, maybe a statue. I didn't know. And uh, at that point in my life, I knew basically nothing about royalty. I could have cared less. In fact, history was my least favorite subject of all, other than maybe some military aspects of it. And uh, so within a month of having prayed, literally standing outside reading this New Testament, outside a dorm, at the academy, uh, I had in my hands, in my possession, the official lineage chart. Well, not the lineage chart, the official heraldic achievement here that you see on this uh, book. I found that in the cadet library at the Air Force Academy after uh, a local pastor, Monty Judah at that time, had shown me an unofficial version of this that was cropped, partially cut off, missing. And so I went back to the drawing room and looked for this. And then uh, I went to the cadet library and then uh, Monty had the English name calculation also at that time, but not having the full official heraldic achievement like this. So I had both those things in my possession uh, in less than a month of having asked God to show me who and what was being spoken of. Initially, I went to a, a Shabbat lunch, you know, lunch after services to Monty Judah's home. He was an assistant pastor at that time in Colorado Springs at the congregation there. And I had only recently been introduced to Messianic Judaism at that point. Uh, you know, being connected through Jews for Jesus via uh, a captain, one of the pastors at the Air Force Academy at the Cadet Chapel. At any rate, Monty just uh, pulled out that imagery, which is like a yeah, a black and white photocopy of a cropped off unofficial version of Charles World Achievement that was only partially there, uh, but enough, you know, to see what was on it. And then the English name calculation that he and some of his buddies put together through a computer program at Martin uh, Martin Marietta at the time. He was working in the defense industry when he first did that. Uh, and so I thought, well, isn't that interesting? And so that same day, I went back to the academy, went to the cadet library, started to look for books on heraldry. And I found literally, John, the one book in the whole world that had this official heraldic achievement named Boutel's Heraldry at that time. So I found the full thing, and then I just began to study this to try to understand what these symbols meant to to read up on heraldry and try to understand heraldry in general, how these coats of arms were laid out. Tim, can you make that a little larger on your screen and then start kind of going through it? Because uh, uh, I think most of John's audience is going to be familiar with Revelation 13, and I know you know this like the back of your hand as far as Revelation 13, but, but well, again... I 
it was the Commonwealth Games and the ceremony that got me interested. And then I listened to your uh, interview with Janie, uh, where you went into this. And again, if you could just kind of break down the the symbolism that's in Daniel and Revelation and how it correlates to this this heraldic achievement, which I would call a coat of arms, but I'm from Alabama. So, <laughs> and John, yeah, it's. It's officially called an heraldic achievement. It's unofficially or informally called a coat of arms. Hey, by people hey, who and real quick, John, I think John has a question. Go ahead, John. So, all right. Sorry, I was muted. My my bad. I was interested in the in the book that you said that you found the heraldic achievements in the the. Um, I guess you you said you found a book. You found one book that was available for that. What was that? Boutels Heraldry, B O U T E L L S. Okay. Heraldry. Okay. Yeah. And in the center, toward the center of the book, there was one of the plates that had this coat of arms. And this was first shown to the world at uh, Charles July 1969 Investiture's Prince of Wales. So it was reproduced on the order of service, little pamphlet handed out to people who attended that. And it was also on plates and saucers sold as memorabilia at the event. Um, but the only book that had it, of course, I hadn't seen any of that memorabilia, which is rare, but the only book that had it was Boutel's Heraldry. And the Cadet Library had a shelf of maybe, I don't know, two, two and a half feet in length of books next to each other in Heraldry. Not a ton, you know, compared to the number of books written on the topic, but they happened to have this one book that uh, had the coat of arms. Yeah, and start to interesting. enlarge it and maybe break it down uh, for uh, for our audiences. Uh, I mean, the red dragon is the one that just just leaps out at me right away. You might want to start with somewhere else, but and so and something to people to note too: these symbols that are on these. There's one source for this. This is not like okay, well, this could mean this, this could mean this. All of them have direct meanings put together by a certain guild. Am I correct in that, Tim? So there are international laws that apply to heraldry. And when you get into formal heraldry, heraldry like this, particularly royal heraldry, they have to follow those laws. And one of those is that it's unique to the individual to whom it's granted. No one else can ever have one like it. So they take some of the symbols in the case of British royal coats of arms or herald, heraldic achievements. They take some symbols from the mother's heraldic achievement. If she has one, some from the father's. If he has one, they combine them. Uh, and then they add some additional unique symbols for the individual to whom the achievement is being granted. And uh, that makes it unique to that person in all history. No one else will ever have it. And so it's an occult form of artwork and you actually read it like a book, uh, top to bottom. And I'll say left to right, you know, this is our left and our right, but it's really right to left, more like Hebrew uh, from the Herald's perspective, because these beasts are looking at you. So what we see here on the right-hand side is really the left-hand side from the Herald's perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this sinister beast, that's what this unicorn is called, and its position, it's in a sinister position, is actually the left-hand side of the heraldic achievement. This Dexter beast uh, is actually the right-hand side because they're looking at you. And the overall heraldic achievement has its own head, so it's a corporate beast. It's not just comprised of a bunch of individual symbols and individual beasts. It is its own corporate entity as a living spiritual entity so far as the heraldists are concerned they're occultists and that's one thing you need to understand this is not just artwork it's not just symbolism to them it's an it's an occult form of it's almost sorcery and witchcraft if you will if you want to think of it that way so this is a living beast in their mind if you want to think of it that way so this was produced primarily by the college of heraldry in uh, london and they are the most prominent body of heralds in the entire world and so following that, it was the Garter Herald King, who is the head of that college, who granted this, you know, finalized it and uh, granted it to Charles and actually participated, in fact, in Charles' investiture in July 1969 when this was first shown to the world. So laying out some of these symbols, you have actually the beast with feet like a bear right down here. Can you enlarge Bottom. that uh, perhaps and, and then kind of as you're doing it? Um, there you go. Yeah. Maybe move it up and down. Okay. Feet like the feet of a bear. Uh, body like the body of a leopard. Mouth like the mouth of a lion. Now, you'll notice it's not actually the feet of a bear here. It's not actually the body of a leopard. It's not actually the mouth of a lion. 
The scripture that we read in Revelation 13 says, like, like, like. In other words, we're talking about similes. That imagery is evoked or we're, or we're reminded of it, in other words, when we see this symbol. Now, as it turns out, um, and I'll show it to you, uh, there were two unofficial versions, or excuse me, two graven versions, I'm trying to say, of this achievement with the devices separated from one another. So these are all devices, and I'll come back to that separated from one another on Karen Arvon Castle at two of the entrances, showing the graven version of these symbols as if they were cast iron, but they were produced with plaster and painted to look like cast iron, and they were quite large. So they hung over the, in one case, over the water gate on Eagle Tower, and in another case, over the Queen's Gate, where, and Charles was presented to the Welsh people at the Queen's Gate, and he entered and left the castle at the, Eagle, excuse me, through the, uh, Eagle Gate, uh, uh, the Water Gate on the Eagle Tower, pardon me. And uh, so I can show you the one as an example on uh, the Eagle Tower, which um, will be interesting just to, and I'm mentioning that because, um, took a bunch of photos of it here and I need to uh, pick what's best, but let me just, uh, just go with this one for a moment. So you see this? Yep. You'll notice the dragon isn't there. The three ostrich feather uh, badge of the Black Prince isn't there. Some other things are not there. That's because they're actually present at other points uh, on the castle. They're all present on the castle hanging on the outside of it, but they separated the devices around the castle. And so this is that same Dexter beast. But as it turns out, it actually has bear's claws in both versions. There are two versions of this graven heraldic achievement for Charles. This is his July 1969 investiture. So I didn't show this in the first edition of the Antichrist and Captivity because I didn't have good enough images to show at that time of the graven versions. I do now. And they're in the uh, second edition. But anyway, I'll Make this a little larger here in a moment, a, a higher quality version. But you can see Charles is standing below this. This is after he's been invested and now they're leaving, getting ready to go back to the train station as Prince of Wales. And if I just uh, see if we can quickly find one or not, or I'll just pull it up. Let's do this. Yeah, so this one's a little bit hard to see, but these are actually bear's claws. They're not lion's claws on this. And I thought that was incredibly interesting. And you notice these frills here on the legs, John, Scott. Yeah, those are, this? yeah, those are interesting. I was wondering about that myself. Yeah. That's meant to uh, represent bear's fur when it's wet, kind of like when it's wet, you do not see that on lion's legs at all. You do on bears. Yeah, and it's more obvious on the version that's over the queen's gate. And I, I don't have a photo in this set to show you on that. But um, anyway, the point is the uh, graven versions will be in uh, the second edition of the Antichrist Kepti for people to see. So even though it's like, 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 they're actually using bear's claws in the graven versions at Charles, July 1969 investiture. Now, in all cases, also, the unicorn has human eyes, a man's eyes. That's unusual, heraldically. So this beast is completely unique in history to Charles. No one ever had it before. No one else does now. Not even his sons, William or Harry. Normally, it's a lion leopard or a normal lion for England. Uh, the unusual feat here, that's not been present on any other heraldic achievement or, or any other Dexter beast like this in royal coats of arms. So it's unique to Charles. The unicorn with the man's eyes, not completely unique to Charles, but unusual heraldically. So it's not common, but because it's in combination with this, it's unique. This red dragon right here is the same red dragon spoken of in Revelation 12 and 13. It actually goes back to the standards of the Roman cohorts that occupied ancient Britannia and prior to that ancient Wales. So this derives from whistling banners that were called dragon banners that the Romans used in uh, ancient Wales and then prior to that ancient Judea. So when John was talking about the red dragon, when he wrote about it in Revelation 13, this is the dragon he was talking about, not the Chinese red dragon, which of course is, you can argue is a, just another version of it, but this is the one he was talking about 
historically. I will point out one thing here too before I go into these other symbols. Uh, a lot of people have looked at William's heraldic achievement, John. Yeah. And Scott and said, well, William has the red dragon on his heraldic achievement too. And they point to this thing right here that I'm circling on the royal shield in one of the quarters. That is a red lion. It is not a dragon. And because people are seeing it, you know, in a smaller version, it confuses them. So William and Harry do not have the red dragon on the heraldic achievements, and they never will. Even though William is now Prince of Wales, he'll never have this imagery. So we can come back around to that. But here's what I'll say. So this can beast... I, can I ask you one question real yeah. quick and I, before we go on? So what yeah, I'm seeing course. down here underneath the, hor the horse's feet here and, and the the leopard's feet, what does that signify for them to be underneath there encircled like that? Is there a special significance for that area? Yes. Okay. So these are called compartments okay. in heraldry. And this is the motto of the overall heraldic achievement. And on these royal achievements, there's also a motto around the royal shield. And Charles has both the royal shield right here and the shield of Wales as Prince of Wales. So you actually read this, I said, like a book. So this motto, it means I serve. This right here is the shield of the Black Prince, historically, the founding Prince of Wales of the Order of the Garter, founded in 1348. Uh, he was known as Edward the Black Prince. He was called that because he dressed in black and supposedly he was a feared military commander throughout Europe at the time. So he and the British monarch... Uh, at the time, founded the Order of the Garter. And so the two highest ranking knights in the Order of the Garter are the British monarch of the day and the Prince of Wales of the day. And this belt that you see around the Royal Shield is the belt of the Order of the Garter. It's the most prominent and oldest continually existing order of chivalry or knighthood in the world. So it still exists. So anyway, this motto, Ik Dien, says, I, the Black Prince, serve. Now, this badge right here is known as the Badge of the Black Prince. You'll notice it has the same motto, Ik Dien. These three ostrich feathers represent the Black Prince as well, and it's like three letters Vav in the Hebrew language, mm -hmm. the way that they're formed here, like Vav, 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 or 666. So six, 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 yeah. Right. Yeah, and, and but that is, not, that is not the basis for calculating the number of the name. I want to be clear about that, and we'll come back to actually showing the calculation. Doesn't Charles have a ring that he wears constantly, Tim? That uh, that has that symbolism on it, uh, the like ostriches or something like that. It, it basically it's a cultic, but yeah. So I'll read this and then tell you about the ring. So it says, "I the okay. Black Prince," because this is the badge of the Black Prince. So you can read it, "I the Black Prince," or you can read it, "I the Black Prince," because this shield. These two symbols are both specific historically to the founding Prince of Wales of the Order of the Guard of the Black Prince. So it reads, and you could also say it is I, the Prince of Darkness, or the Black One. But the formal terminology in, in uh, history here is Black Prince. So I, the Black Prince, serve the Red Dragon or Satan. That's what it reads as John. He's okay, telling that, you that he serves the devil. That makes uh, interesting. You know, it's really interesting. So I just got done reading... Um, the history of the kings of britain uh the the only basically the only history book of the kings of britain and um there's a prophecy by and i wouldn't call it a prophecy more like a i guess well i i would assume that merlin was a wizard but he had a prophecy about a red dragon and a white dragon and it all derived from whales over there it's really interesting i i, I thought that you know, when I looked at this dragon, first off, too, what is what is the significance of the blue? Is this the him coming from the the water? Is this the significance of that? Is that what I'm looking at, or is that something completely uh, different? Are you talking about behind the harp, or are you behind the about uh, underneath the dragon? Okay, so that's a green field standing okay. atop an isle, like standing atop gotcha. the British Isles, for example. Now, gotcha. Cairn Arvon Castle itself is literally it literally borders. Um, a sea, if you will, or, or a body like an ocean. It literally borders it and rises out of the sea in a sense. The castle does where Charles was invested and there was a green field, you know, in the center of the castle where Charles was invested. And the red dragon was on every wall inside and outside the castle. You could see it everywhere. It hung as huge 
white sheets, like white sheets with the red dragon in the center and gold tassels at the bottom. So kind of like a sheet, but a banner that was mostly just white with the red dragon in the center. And that banner was hung in multiple places all over the castle on the interior and the exterior walls. So that when Charles was crowned Prince of Wales, he was facing that dragon and it was to his left and his right. And it was behind him. And likewise, his mother, when she put the crown on his head, was facing that dragon and it was behind her and it was to her left and her right. And then uh, the red dragon was adopted in 1953 as the national symbol of Wales, even though Wales had been using it for many centuries you know, as a prominent symbol in Wales. Uh, and it was on something known as the badge of Wales. Uh, they made it their official national symbol, kind of like the United States has the eagle on one side of its seal is our heraldic symbol. <laughs> or the phoenix. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's an eagle though on our on our yeah. our national seal. Yeah. But it's a, a bald eagle. But in this case, uh, the red dragon was adopted as Wales national symbol in 1953. In 1958, the queen announced to the Welsh people that she would that that year she was creating quote unquote Charles as Prince of Wales and would one day formally invest him and present him for that investiture to the people of Wales. Now that happened 11 years later in July of 1969, the same month that uh, we went to the moon, you know, that uh, the Apollo era landed a man on the moon. So uh, that being said, um, Charles, for that reason, when he was crowned, you know, facing that dragon and so forth as Prince of Wales was literally made Prince of the Red Dragon or Satan's Prince on that day. Now, William now has the title, you know, he's been created Prince of Wales by Charles when Charles ascended the throne, but he's not been invested. And William has said he has no interest in being invested as Prince of Wales, and there are no plans to ever invest him as Prince of Wales. So that being said, now that Charles is king, he has some new heraldic achievements. People get confused and they think this one is gone. And part of that because they're misinformed in the press and so forth. It's not. This remains Charles' heraldic achievement forever. He just has some new ones in addition to this as king. So this, in other words, remains his calling card heraldically, if you will. Now, going through these symbols a little bit, and then we'll come back to some other stuff in relation to all this. We see that this beast matches what's in Revelation 13. In Daniel chapter 7, in the Old Testament, the same individual who rules for three and a half years, you know, during the great tribulation over this coming global government is identified with different, different imagery as a little horn having an, a man's eyes. That's in Daniel chapter seven in the old Testament. But he said to rule in Daniel seven uh, and nine between those chapters for a time, times and a half a time or three and a half years. And likewise, in the book of revelation, we read elsewhere uh, that this first beast here, rules for a time times and a half a time or 42 months or 1260 days that same period of the great tribulation so as it turns out the little horn of the eyes of man the beast of feet like a bear body like a leopard mouth like a lion are the same individual and so when we talk about these symbols you see this thing around the necks john yeah no I, okay those are interesting little things there yeah <laughs> every symbol has specific meaning none of it is accidental it's all intentional it all has specific meaning in heraldry so these, these things are called the label of the eldest son. Charles being the eldest son in line to the throne. That's what was placed around the necks of the beasts that represent him specifically on the heraldic achievement. So what it means by having it right here is that this beast specifically represents Charles himself. Same thing with this little horn of the eyes of man or unicorn with human eyes. This represents Charles himself. And by the way, Charles is known as unicorn to our secret service when he visits the United States. That's his code word. Mm. And is and there, do you refers, have any other pictures? Do you have any other pictures of any other heraldries to show like, okay, this is one that you don't see this on every one of the heraldries. Cause I, I haven't no, I haven't paid attention to that actually part. I remember reading about that in the book, but is it normal? I guess what I'm asking, is it normal to have those on every beast that's in, in the photograph? Uh, no. So, for example, the red dragon is associated with the Tudors. It was gotcha. centuries ago when a red dragon was lashed on a royal coat of arms. It's been centuries prior to Charles. 
hmm. before this was on our royal coat of arms again. Yeah, and uh, so this was uniquely added for Charles since he was um, invested Prince of Wales. And likewise, this badge of the Black Prince, uniquely added for Charles. And sorry, Scott, you asked me about the signet ring, so let me come back to that. Yeah, well, real quick before we get there, I, I, I found it mm -hmm. interesting. Uh, in the investiture uh, of Charles, uh, in a quote that he had made uh, about where he talked about his father, as opposed, and we all know that it was his queen, the, the, the queen mother, that crowned him, but that, I, I found that interesting. John may not have heard that before, and I don't know. If yeah, that was Charles is yet. Charles is quoted in a, in his biographies as saying his father put the crown on his head, that his father gave him the vestments. You know, in July 1969, when he was invested Prince of Wales, and the whole world saw that it was his mother that did that. So why did Charles say it was his father who did it? And Charles said that more than once. So I actually give the uh, quote and cite the source uh, in even the first edition of the Antichrist and the Cup of Tea that's in the book. Uh, you might have seen that, John. It's in the uh, chapter yes. dealing with the heraldic achievement. But, yep. but there's two things about that. One is a particular frame of the multiple cameras that filmed you know, live footage, the investiture. In July 1969, there was one of the cameras on, on actually a set of frames that captured an X like flash. And that X went through through the backrest of the throne of the queen from which she stood up, which had the dragon engraved on it, through Prince Philip, through the queen, and through Prince Charles' head. And I just refer to it as X lightning. That was at the same moment the queen was putting the crown on Charles' head. Wow. There was another thing captured by the same camera when Charles was exiting the Chamberlain Tower to walk toward the uh, dice, the disc, you know, where he was going to be crowned, you know, and he was being preceded by the Garter Herald King and so forth to that uh, disc. But as he was exiting the Chamberlain Tower in that same reel of footage, there were lion-like paws that, that were, they looked bright, you know, like lightning that appeared literally as he was exiting the Chamberlain Tower on the side of the um, tower, on the side of the entrance, you know, and the exit from which he was coming out of the tower into the center of the castle. You know, it's an oh. open air castle. Yeah. So again, just captured on a few frames, it was like blink, you know, and the audience, anyone not paying attention would just miss it. So I believe that the devil actually possessed Charles' mother uh, right before she put the crown on Charles' head. And when he was saying his father did that, he was referring to Satan. Mm. And Prince Philip was sitting behind the queen uh, on his throne when the crown was put on Charles' head. There were three gray well slate thrones, only one of which had a backrest. And on that backrest, it was the queen's in the center that the same dragon, this red dragon, was engraved in Welsh slate. And behind that throne on the castle wall were multiple red dragon banners. And then on the opposite castle wall, more multiple red dragon banners. You know, the queen and Charles both facing those in opposite directions. So Charles was literally invested Satan's prince and the red dragon literally gave him his power throne and great authority. And he literally referred to Satan as his father. Hey, and Tim, I, I just pulled back up the, uh, the, the heraldry. If you could go over some of the other uh, symbolism that's, that's there uh, in, in Daniel, we talk about revelation a lot, but in Daniel as well, uh, well some me, of the things that are like maybe in the middle uh, I've heard you explain it before um, yeah. as far as the seven and the 10, uh, maybe, maybe enlarge it and kind of, kind of for John and I sake and the audience sake, explain what we're seeing or why this fits with what scripture, why you believe this fits with what scripture saying. Yeah. Let me explain because this relates to the middle also. Can you enlarge it a little bit? So, uh, yeah, just... but I, I don't want to do that just yet. So okay. this lion leopard bear beast is normally a lion or lion leopard representing England. Okay. But here it specifically represents Charles because of this label of the eldest son around its neck. The unicorn is normally with, you know, a round horse's eye, no visible sclera or eye white, not a V-shaped socket like a human eye. On both Charles' official and unofficial, his most prominent unofficial heraldic achievement, the one that I first saw in 1987, uh, it has a very obvious 
a human man's eyes, you know, with a visible sclera V-shaped eye socket, even more visible and obvious on that unofficial version. And I call it unofficial, but it's really semi-official. And then the red dragon, you know, represents whales, right? Adopted 1958 uh, as Wales national symbol. The harp here is Ireland's national symbol. One of the few countries in the world, really, that doesn't have a satanic symbol, you know, for it, for it uh, nationally. And you know, this is supposed to be the Davidic harp carried away, you know, they got the symbol from the Arch of Titus carried away from the second temple by the Romans. You know, uh, so they chose that as their national symbol, the Irish did. This is the shield of Wales. It's got four lions, normally lions or lion leopards representing, in this case, Wales on it. Charles also was granted his own standard or flag with those same four on it. Can I can I stop you for just for a second? You said the Arch uh -huh. of Titus. Have you have you read the book by Chad Schaefer, um, the Triumphal Arc of Titus? I have very good book. Probably. Yeah, it's interesting, and I guess basically that you're we're talking about the Arch of Baal. This is like the the Baal, the the worshippers of Baal, that arch. If this is the Triumphal Arc of Titus, according to his book, anyway. So, anyways, just throwing that out there. Well, I have to find out more about that because I'm unfamiliar with this book. It's the first I've yeah. heard of it. It's, yeah. it's been he's had it out for a while. It's pretty interesting, but it talks about how they, uh, you know, this was the arch they were trying to put up in New York City. This is the arch that they uh, put up there as the Arch of Baal. They they changed the name of it so that people wouldn't freak out, but uh, you know, gave it its older name, I guess, rather than uh, the Arch of Baal. Because I think the first right. time they tried it, they're like, "Nah, we're not having the Arch of Baal here," but they just changed the name. So. Yeah, it weighs multiple tons. I did hear about that arch that they put up there. Yeah, the, the, the premise yeah. would be Babylon or Rome has has always right. marked their territory by arches. Right. Uh, yeah. And you see them all throughout history uh, through battles and conquests, and they, they, they memorialize them with an arch. And he traces all the arches throughout history. So it's, a, it's an interesting read for anybody in John's audience or mine or yours that might want to check it out. And Chad's a good guy. So, yeah. So coming back to this, let me enlarge it for you. There we go. So this, yeah, this harp is for Ireland. This is for Wales, the Shield of Wales, and for Charles, right, as uh, Prince of Wales at the time. This red lion is for Scotland. It's actually known as the Red Lion of Scotland. These other six normally lions or lion leopards, and by the way, uh, in higher resolution versions of this standard of wales that was granted to charles and the royal shield of england is what this is these are six lion leopards or lion leopard bears these are all actually lion leopard bears all 10 of them are uh in the case of charles or all the achievement but you cannot see that uh easily in this artistic rendering normally a lion in heraldry has uh three claws uh once in a while four not five but normally just three this one actually has five, but the fifth one is hidden behind it. And you can actually make out the fifth one in that graven heraldic achievement that I showed you that was hanging over um, the water gate on the Eagle Tower at Cairnarvon Castle. And you can see on that one and the one in the Queen's Gate, if you look closely, there are actually five claws per foot for that one. So it's not a normal heraldic lion for that reason as well. But these 10 are all lion leopards or lion leopard bears. I believe they're lion leopard bears, kind of like chips off the old block, if you will, for Charles. Now, these are called the lions of Tarshish in Scripture, in the Bible, in the Old Testament. And Tarshish is not, uh, you know, people have argued that it could be Spain or Gibraltar, like the Straits of Gibraltar. Uh, in fact, Tarshish was always England, biblically, and I address that in the book. So... These are known as the Lions of Tarshish uh, in Scripture, but they're the Lions of England in heraldry. And in this case, they're all lion leopard bears. And so Charles has 10 of them, and that's interesting because there are 10 kings, right? Under the Antichrist, the little horn of the eyes of man in Daniel chapter 7. But of these, only seven have unobscured heads, you know, where you can see the eyes, if you count the ones that the heads are not obscured. There are seven crowns on this heraldic achievement. If you count the, the crowns, there are seven of them. This beast here is the same one as this Dexter beast. It's just another instance of it put up at the top. Same one. And uh, representing Charles again, though. So 
And then this is the most important point right here. You'll notice that you have this label of the eldest son right beneath this helm in the center of the heraldic achievement, right? This is the overall head of the corporate beast. So the overall corporate beast, the whole heraldic achievement, in other words, represents Charles because of this label here put under this helm or, or on the neck, if you will, of the, over, the uh, corporate beast, if you want to think of it that way. So notice here that there are seven bars in the helm, John and Scott. Mm -hmm. Okay. And these are like three plucked up by the roots. They look like uh, chemistry flasks in a sense, upside down with a band connecting them at the base, right? Like roots would be connected. So in scripture, both the Greek and the Hebrew, as it turns out, a horn, you know, the word translated as horn can mean something shaped like an elephant's tusk, like you see right here for these bars on the helm. Can mean something conical, like you see here for the unicorn's horn, the little horn in the eyes of man. Can mean something shaped like a chemistry vial, upside down, like you see on these three. So what you're literally looking at here is 10 horns in the center of the heraldic achievement for the head of the overall heraldic achievement, three of which are plucked up by the roots. And the little horn of the eyes of man comes up among them. The precise imagery described in Daniel chapter 7. Interesting. You know, I, I was just, the three bear, the bear that have, I guess grabs the ribs, has the ribs in the mouth and the three ribs. Do you relate that to that at all? I know I found something interesting in the, uh, the history of so, the kings of Britain uh, about Gog and I guess Gog and Magog had, or there was a battle between two giants and um, Gog had broken three of the ribs of one of the, of, of the giant. Uh, and I just, I thought that was interesting because that was actually a happened right there in, uh, in England, that battle. But uh, anyways, go on. So there are multiple meanings in scripture for those three ribs. And I do address them in even the first edition of the Antichrist and the Cup of Tea. You don't see them in the mouth of this beast right here, this Dexter beast. They're not there in this one. This is Charles' right. official world achievement. In the prominent unofficial one that I show inside the book, you do see them. And there are some specific changes between that version of the heraldic achievement and this one. And that's because this is prophetic artwork. It's meant to foretell the future, which I don't think I mentioned till now uh, in this interview, but it's meant to foretell the future. So you'll notice here this chain around the unicorn is bound to this compartment containing the red dragon and the dragon isn't touching anything, right? Outside of the the grassy knoll that is standing atop, right? Right. It's not touching the compartment. And the chain here is bound. And the hoof of the unicorn, and by the way, these are boar's hooves. They're not uh, from a horse or from a goat. They're actually boar's hooves. I recently discovered, I thought they were goat's hooves until I recently learned they're actually boar's hooves. So, and these tufts here are like what you'd see on a goat, only a little more ornate. And, and some of them wouldn't be on a goat, but they're added as if they were on a goat. This one's like you'd see on a goat, like a billy goat. Mm -hmm. But um, anyway, this chain in heraldry is officially called a restrainer. And unless people look into heraldry, they'll never know that. They just think it's a chain, right? It has a very specific meaning and function on these heraldic achievements. So the key things, though, are that... Uh -huh. I was going to say, and to your point earlier, this is all occultic. And that's one reason all I wanted to bring John on, because John, uh, one of the things I've learned from him and David is they do a lot, they do a lot deeper dive into some of this to teach their audience as to what to look for. But that's what I was fascinated by. I just always looked at this as crazy European, you know, <laughs> European art, I guess. But it's really occultic, right, Tim? It is. All of it is. And, yeah, they, and the reason they believe I in these symbols, mm -hmm. if I if I can, they believe in these symbols, these sigils, these. They even have, you know, the occult people and witchcraft and stuff even have secret names for their children. Uh, you know, there's so much there's so much about their culture that's hidden, but yet it's there, and obviously. Tim found their literature that explains what we're looking at, but they definitely believe in symbolism, bind, binding by symbols, and they kind of rule the world through binding symbols. I mean, it's, it's basically what they do. I mean, you see the Freemasonry symbols all over the world. 
uh, that are they're basically buying the cities. As soon as you go into the cities, the first thing you see is free and accepted, and this is their threshold. You know, these symbols they believe give them the ability and allowance to rule. So, and, um, and I'm fast forwarding uh, for Tim, and I'm sure he'll get get there. Uh, we could talk about this for hours and hours, but yeah, uh, I, I believe uh, from past uh, discussions uh, that I've listened to with Tim, the conversations we've had. Uh, from what he, from what his research is, is is that Charles is the ultimate head of Freemasonry, uh, and so that's something that every every king, every king or queen or whoever becomes the ruler of of uh, England is in fact the head of Freemasonry without a doubt. So I know your audience, most of your audience. Yeah, I'll, ex me. I'll explain that how that works actually formally in a moment. I'll explain how that actually works. Charles, right, by the way, is not. The yeah, Charles is not. Excuse me. I was just pulling back up the coat of arms. So okay, yeah, Charles is not a Freemason, but he is over Freemasonry globally. Has been all this time for decades. So I'll come back to that. But anyway, one of the changes between this official heraldic achievement and the other one that I show in the Antichrist and Capiti, it's even shown in the 1998 edition. So you've seen it, John. You asked about what's in the mouth of this beast. So. There, are, there is something that looks a bit like a horseshoe, but with angular corners rather than rounded here between the teeth of this beast in the unofficial version. And then the other thing that the changes that's particularly significant is that the chain is loosed. It's no longer bound. And this, by the way, I mentioned is called a restrainer in heraldry. So the restrainer is loosed in, the, uh, in that other version. The hoof is lifted. It's no longer touching this compartment here of this unicorn. And the red dragon is touching the compartment at a few points. So in other words, the red dragon reaches up, touches the compartment. All of a sudden, the unicorn lifts its hoof. The unicorn takes on a deathly appearance, uh, a very evil, sinister, deathly appearance as well. The eye becomes even more V-shaped, you know, with a more visible uh, sclera or eye white. And the chain is loosed. What it symbolizes is, in the future, this Satan possessing Charles himself. Because this beast, this little horn of the eyes of a man, represents Charles. He is the unicorn with a man's eyes. And he is also Satan. The fat, You notice that the label here is around the neck of the red dragon? I don't know if I pointed that out before in this interview, but you, you see this here? That specifically yep. means that Satan becomes Charles and Charles becomes Satan. He becomes the red dragon. So it's telling us that the devil is going to possess Charles and that he's already animating Charles, if not possessing him. Okay, at least animating him. But but the point is, when he touches this, the chain is loose, the, the unicorn is rears back, and the eyes become more obviously a man's eyes. Uh, but this is the restrainer being loose. This is what 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is actually talking about. People look at that and they read him and he, you know, with the restrainer in connection with that in, the, in uh, a variety of translations. But the Greek word that's translated as he or him can also be translated it. So it's both a thing and a person. The person in this case is, yes, the Holy Spirit is no longer restraining at a point and the Antichrist, you know, goes and does his thing. He's, he's revealed in a general sense at that point, but it's also an it, and the it is this chain when it's loosed. So I address that in the book. Now, to your question, John, the three ribs, they have multiple meanings biblically, and one of them is they represent Israel being carried away into captivity. They represent uh, Israel's, you know, like ribs being taken from Israel's rib cage, if you will, by this beast. You know, here's another change. You, you see this lion, leopard, bear, beast is pawing the harp mm -hmm. right here? Yeah. Okay, that's July 1969 when this was first unveiled to the world. What was happening at that time? Conflict between England and the IRA, you know, with Ireland, right? You also have a conflict between between you know some in my studies one thing you can kind of look at too that I is just something to throw out there but I found a really strong connection with um the Scythians and the 12 tribes and also the land of Gog, Gog being the chief principality of those controlling Magog and all that and also leading straight directly to 
England. Of course, every bloodline that's of prominence leads there. But it's interesting, too, because that struggle is kind of um, documented in their history, but in, in, in more of an allegorical way. Um, so that's really interesting to me. Uh, because I, you know, I believe I in eschatology wise, we're going to differ on eschatology because I believe you believe in dispensationalism to a certain extent. Yeah. And I'm, yeah. and I'm a all, all millennial, I'm an all millennialist. So I believe that, that Satan is chained, waiting to be unchained right now. And I believe like, you know, so in, when, if we're looking at revelation chapter 12, I believe we're in the throes of Satan being unleashed and, and the chief principality Gog, but also that first beast that comes out of the water it has a representation of that so that's if just to kind of throw you kind of where i'm at in that but okay, I, I think so it's really you, interesting yeah are you open to being corrected on that and learning more about <laughs> i'm i'm always thing? i'm always open to that i'm always open to any kind of correction or if if you can if now and let me let me be honest with you i like i've 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 studied it quite a bit and i'm not saying that you're wrong or i'm wrong i'm just saying i'm always open to correction in fact my view has changed on this in the last 15 years uh, well, towards all millennialism, uh, all of millennialism. So, like, I'm yeah. open to being corrected if there's a valid reason, and if there's enough scripture to convince me that otherwise, otherwise, I'm, you know, obviously, you know, scripture has to interpret scripture. Scripture has to be the final drawdown on that. I'm not like, you know, I'm sold. I have to preach this or I get fired at my church type guy. Uh, but yeah, so I here, mean, I'm always here, open here's, to. to here's what I'm that. gonna do. Uh, part of the position you just espoused is historicist. I'm going to circle back around to addressing specifically your points, okay. uh, but not yet. We can do it on another wanna... show. How about yeah, we, we do it on a let's, whole other show? Hey, let's do that on let's a whole other yes. show. Because, yes. because, yeah, John, I'm not a dispensationalist, but I would be what someone might would say. Uh, I do believe in a literal seventh day kingdom, a 1,000 year reign. But do so not. Me, this I do. I do as well. I do as well. And I'll, I'll have to explain to you guys how one day. But I think now is like this is a this is yeah, one of those conversations on that could go on for two hours just in that subject. So yeah, yeah. my bad for. Well, bringing I have it up listen. I have, <laughs> a, so I have a. I have a three and a half hour teaching, John, just on the timing of the rapture. Three and a half well, hours long. That's available well, through Prophecy House called the Real Rapture. So. <laughs> Yeah, hey, I, hey, I don't even believe I don't even it. believe in the rapture. So let's let's go. <laughs> we better, you we will someday going. when we're done talking about uh, it. Hey, maybe I, so. I, I, hope, I, I hope there's yeah. a rapture, brother. I hope there is. Trust me. Yeah. There, will, there will definitely yeah. be a gathering. No doubt. Yes, there'll be a gathering. Yeah. Well, the rapture is is part of the gathering. They go together. Let's, so let's let's get back at any rate. Yeah. Yeah. Another time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah but I do. Time. Since the word dispensation was thrown out there, I do want to say one thing. <laughs> yeah. pre-tribulationists pre-tribulationists claim to be dispensationalists and when you get to the root of what they really mean by that and i've read their writings i know pre-tribulationism better than any pre-tribulationist on the planet probably so you know and i started out as an ardent pre-tribulationist till god corrected me didn't take them long to correct me but that's how i started out at the root of it what they're talking about when they say they're they're dispensationalists is they believe that they are interpreting the scripture literally. So they believe that they are following a literal hermeneutic and that that's what makes them dispensationalists. My point that I made to Scott here just in the last couple of days is if you accept, if we accept that definition that being dispensational is really just following a literal interpretation of scripture, then in reality, the people who are calling themselves dispensationalists while being pre-tribulationists are anti dispensationalists they're not actually dispensationalists and it is the post post-tribulational premillennialists or you know those who believe there's a literal thousand year reign and who are post-tribulational in terms of the timing of the rapture in regard to their understanding of scripture those are the folks who are actually the dispensationalists so in other words if you want to go by the definition the pre-tribulationists are using of what is a dispensationalist then i'm the real dispensationalist and they are not <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, you, just I just yeah. just find it as like Darby, you know what Darby presented as dispensationalism. Yes, uh, but I yeah, I to totally get what you're saying. We'll we'll definitely discuss yeah. it sometime. I'm always up for, you know, a good discussion on the subject, because like I said, uh -huh. I'm not I'm not one to not change my mind if I believe that there's truth and validity to another way of thinking. I, I definitely oh, am not like, a, yeah, that would be a good three way, even four way. We, we might could bring in Dr. Hamp on that and have a have a chat just on oh, that. That would be fun. That hours. would be fun. It would. That would be fun. It would. All right. So we've seen that Charles has the imagery. 
on his heraldic achievement that's described here in Revelation 13, 8, Revelation 13, you know, the beast with feet like a bear, body like a leopard, mouth like a lion. To whom the dragon gives his power, throne, and great authority. All that is very literal, already fulfilled of Charles. It's as Prince of Wales, in fact, that he built up his power base around the world. Charles has been running the world, and I'll come back to this, since July 1969. He has not only been the top globalist on the planet, he has been running the world behind the scenes the entire time without having a global government yet. So, for example, Klaus Schwab, right after Charles Investiture, founded the World Economic Forum. Everybody's looking at the WEF and the Great Reset and the massive impact that that's having on the world today, right? Char Klaus Schwab is one of Charles' knights, always has been. You know, he's always subservient to Charles this whole time. He's one of Charles' knights. When we look at the United Nations, it came out of the League of Nations. The League of Nations largely came out of Chatham House or the Royal Institute of International Affairs in London. Charles has had a Chatham House or the RIIA since July 1969, right after that, since his investiture as Prince of Wales, Prince of the Red Dragon. The entire climate agenda that's affecting the world and has been even since anybody really heard of the WEF, you know, publicly in any significant way. The entire climate agenda goes back to Charles, like all the COP agreements with the United Nations uh, that, that are happening annually now or every few years now annually. That stuff goes back to public-private partnerships with Charles, and you can trace it all back all the way back to uh, the Kyoto Protocol in Japan, and then before that, the Rio Earth Summit in the early 1990s. Charles was personally credited by global leadership for the success of the Rio Earth Summit because he personally convened meetings aboard the Royal Yacht Britannia while it was not yet decommissioned uh, with the major stakeholders. Even Al Gore was there for those meetings, and Al Gore acknowledged Charles as the reason that the uh, 19, the Rio Earth Summit, I think it was 1992, but don't quote me on that. But the, uh, the Rio Earth Summit, the reason it was a success. So all of this stuff that is shaking the world today, the whole green agenda, yeah, that's destabilizing our energy and food supplies, et cetera. Literally all of it sits beneath Charles. He has been the motivating factor, the one, for all the globalists, all the world leadership, all these decades behind the scenes. And now he's coming out of the woodwork. And when he was talking about trillions at his disposal at COP26, uh, and by the way, uh, well, I will, I'll, I'll leave the discussion on COP for another time. But when he was talking about trillions at his disposal, you know, people thought, oh, was he talking about the Antichrist? Who is he talking about? Well, prior to that, uh, at COP21, 20, 2015, which Charles personally opened, he gave the first speech at the event. He opened it, even though it was hosted by France's president. Uh, at that event, Charles, you know, bandied about a figure. I think it was about ninety trillion, nine zero trillion dollars, you know, needed to enact their climate change agenda, their 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 climate hysteria agenda. I'll call it, and uh, to enable the taxation for a global government, basically. So when Charles later at COP26 said at his disposal, trillions at his disposal, people thought, is he talking about the Antichrist? In reality, he was referring to himself when he's possessed by the devil. You know, another way, if you will, of saying his father, you know, invested him or crowned him. You know, another angle to that when he was referring to the devil again. So, or himself in the third person when he's possessed by the devil later. But anyway, where I want to go with this is we now have the basis to do the calculation biblically. There's no human being in the history of the world who has had this imagery except for Charles. His own sons, William and Harry, do not have it, and they never will. No one else has ever had it. So, so to your point, Scott, you're looking at the evidence, right? And you're not yet convinced? This is what I well, say to people. No, I'm no, it's uh, okay. I'm not asking you to defend yourself. It's fine. This is, oh, this is what I myself. say to people. You can later, but... This is what I say to people who are of that mindset right now. If you believe that we are nearing that point in history where Yeshua Jesus is going to return, you know, and then his reign is going to begin, you know, his thousand year reign, if that's your viewpoint, then you also have to believe that the Antichrist is alive today, right now, you know, in the world. And so my question to people, you know, of that mindset is this, okay, show me anybody else on the planet who comes even close to remotely having the imagery and the evidence that I show for Charles in the Antichrist and the Cup of Tea, or even the second edition, which has much more. But show me anyone who comes even close to this. 
point out another figure who could be the Antichrist biblically. And of course, they will fail. Their mouths will open if they, if you know, if their tongue's not tied, their their jaw will fall to the ground and they'll have nothing to say because there is no one else on the planet in all history with this imagery and evidence. And so now let's get to the name calculation. It says, here is wisdom, let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man and his number is 666. Okay. There are three points to be made here. One is the person who does it for the real Antichrist has wisdom. Per this passage of scripture, it states it right here in Revelation 13, 18, has wisdom from God. Second point is, uh, you can't do the calculation unless you have the imagery of the beast. That imagery that we've seen on Charles' heraldic achievement, the beast of feet like a bear, body like a leopard, mouth like a lion, associated with a man. Okay, it's the number of a man, right? That imagery of the beast has to in some fashion be associated with that man before you can legitimately do the calculation. So all of these attempts to calculate the number for different people in history, including other individuals in our day, are useless, irrelevant, and a waste of our time as Christians and misguided. Unless the imagery is present, you cannot, you're not authorized biblically to even try to do the name calculation if the imagery isn't present. But once it's present, you're authorized to do the calculation. Charles has the imagery, we're authorized to do the calculation. Third point is this number 666 is not written in the form of Greek words in the underlying Greek text, not the original text, that which in this case is actually the received text. That is the, the text that has the non-corrupt version of this verse in the underlying Greek. You know, and, and much of the majority text also, those manuscripts, although you won't see it uh, in a lot of what they show online from the majority text. So in the received text and most existing Greek manuscripts, ancient ones, you'll see 666 written in three Greek letters. In other words, not in the form of Greek words, but three letters, one for 600, a second for 60, and a third for six. So let me actually show the calculation. So this is a page out of the first edition of the Antichrist and the Cup of Tea. And on this, I'm showing that the title, Prince Charles of Wales, right here, works out to exactly 666 on that biblical numbering system. Now in this, uh, not on this page, I don't think, but maybe the page before it in the first edition, I show that the way that uh, 666 is specified in Revelation 13, 18 in the original Greek manuscripts, it is this letter here for 600 that I'm circling in Greek. Then it is this letter here that I'm circling in Greek for 60. Then it is this letter here that I'm circling in Greek for six. Because it's specified that way, and most of the numbers elsewhere in the New Testament are actually written in the form of Greek words. You know, another example of a, uh, a number that isn't is 144 for the 144,000. In the received text, it's also written with Greek letters, not spelled out in words. The 144 is, which is very interesting. But most numbers in the New Testament are written in the form of Greek words because this one isn't. It actually identifies the uh, system for the calculation. And as it turns out, the system is the ancient biblical numbering system applied to the Greek language sequentially, not phonetically, and expanded to include 500 through 900 in Greek. So the original system is in Hebrew and it cuts off at 400 because there are only 22 characters or hieroglyphs in the Hebrew language. These are the same hieroglyph. They're just the final form of it in Hebrew. So mem and final mem, that kind of thing, you know, uh, noon and final noon, etc. But it's the same character, same sequence in Hebrew. And so Hebrew, it's a sequential system. And then it was applied sequentially to Greek. It was expanded to include 500 through 900. But the original system doesn't include anything after 400. And as it turns out, we cannot, now, now listen to this carefully, uh, John and Scott and the audience, listen to this carefully. You cannot do calculations in Greek. It's a very uh, unusual thing, uh, the Greek language, because in Greek, unlike Hebrew or English, the sequence changes with the capitalization if you're using uppercase or lowercase, and if you mix the case. 
So in, in English, you know, capital A and lowercase a, same sequence. Capital B and lowercase b, it's the same sequence. The sequence doesn't change just because you change the capitalization. In Greek, that's not so. In Greek, the sequence changes with the capitalization. So if you try to do prints with a capital P versus a lower P, you're going to get two different calculations in Greek. So while the system was specified that we're supposed to use for the calculation in Greek, you know, the New Testament was originally written in Greek, we can't actually use Greek for the calculation. We have to look at the original languages. Now, that's very valuable. As it turns out, Nasik Charles of Wales, which is the same title, Prince Charles of Wales, just in Hebrew. So Nasik for Prince, Charles transliterated, Ma for of, Mem for of in Hebrew, Wales transliterated. This is the way it's spelled in modern Israeli Hebrew. That precise title, Prince Charles of Wales, on the original biblical numbering system, works out to precisely 666. If that's all you had, you're in the realm of impossibility almost mathematically. The odds are hugely against that statistically. I mean, almost impossible. When you add the imagery, the coat of arms to that, you actually are in the realm of impossibility at that point in terms of statistics. But then when you find out that the title in English, you know, where you cut it off, you know, WXYZ, because those aren't in the original system. So those are null values. So uh, Prince Charles of Wales in English, sequentially, works out again to exactly 666. And now let me go, sorry, to, there you go, get to it. Here's another way of looking at it. So you see the same titles, Prince Charles of Wales in both cases, works out to exactly 666 with completely different combinations of numbers but on the same sequential system identified from the Greek text of Revelation 13, 18. Here you are literally in the realm of impossibility. Even if the universe were 15, 16, 20 billion years old, it wouldn't matter. Statistically, mathematically, this cannot ever happen, but you're looking at it. It's a fact. So those things alone, the imagery and the name calculation, which are the primary criteria in Revelation 13, if that's all that we had, and by the way, we have much more than that. So I'll circle around to that in a moment. But if that's the only thing we had, this proves Charles is the Antichrist biblically. There is no one else not coming, not in the past. He's it. It also, for that reason, proves that we're near the Lord's return. We're, that, we're in that period in history when, in fact, he's going to come back and he's going to slay Charles at Armageddon. He's going to have him, one of his angels, grab him and cast him down to hell Yeah, at the Battle of Armageddon. So... Now let's look at some of the other things. Yep. A question ahead. I have concerning the uh, the name. So now that his title has changed, what does that change about what you see here? Anything? The reason it doesn't change anything is this is now fulfilled prophecy. Okay. It literally no matter. It, it literally no longer matters what his name is or what the calculation is. You know, for King Charles the Third or any other title, it doesn't matter anymore. It doesn't matter that he's not Prince of Wales from that perspective. The prophecy is meant to identify him. He's been Very identified sure. for decades. The prophecy has already been fulfilled. We're you not expect, looking for its fulfillment. Do you expect to find any other interesting gematria with his new title? I don't. I've investigated it. There is okay. nothing in his new title okay. that calculates the 666. But okay. again, he retains this coat of arms. He retains the imagery. Not the right. title, Prince of Wales. It's He still has the title, but it's dormant. It's absorbed under the crown is, is kind of the terminology it's absorbed. So, you know, we call him King Charles the mm third. -hmm. The reason he still has the title and some people might argue with this, who think they know something about heraldry and, you know, British history and this kind of thing, who know less than they think they do. And this should make it clear to them what the reality is. Charles remains the 21st Prince of Wales. That fact never goes away. William is now the 22nd Prince of Wales. Only a small number of princes of Wales have ever been, you know, invested or presented to the Welsh people, right? Historically, you were going to say something, Scott. Yeah, I was, I was going to. Numerous people on John's channel are, are 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 pointing out, and I've heard you address this, and and I uh, I not necessarily that I 100% align with what you're teaching here, but they keep on pointing out about Charles likes women. Uh, that's yeah. that I'm, I'm seeing that constantly as as a rebuttal to what you're saying. And and I, I do. I personally believe that does not mean that uh, 
in Daniel that this this is a person that hates women or that is homosexual. Uh, certainly with this agenda going on now, the transsexual alphabet Nazi suit nonsense going on. And, and I'm pretty sure Charles has his sticky wicks and as do all the other elites in that. But I, I so, don't uh, think that is a reason to, even though I'm not fully on board with your conclusions, I don't think that's a reason to, to uh, exclude a Charles or exclude someone because they happen to be married and like women. Well, let's <laughs> let's again reiterate that the reason you're not on board, Scott, is because he's not yet uh, <laughs> possessed by the devil, not yet, you know, standing on the Temple Mount or that kind of thing. Not be, not for lack of evidence. I'm anyway, just right? waving to see, brother. Okay. So you already know that. Good, good enough. So, yeah. So I, I just wanted to put that caveat before I answer this question. So everybody, please listen very carefully to what I'm about to say, because it's going to offend you initially. And then I'm going to show you why it's true. So I want you to pay attention and then I want you to, to test what I share afterwards. Okay. Everything about this, this uh, so-called rebuttal about Charles liking women and not fitting Daniel 11. First of all, none of it is true biblically. None of it is true about Charles either. Daniel 11, that passage, the verse in Daniel 11, and we're going to go and look at that verse in a moment, is not about this Antichrist. There are a lot of so-called scholars out there and popular Bible teachers who are looking at that passage in Daniel chapter 11 and saying, this is about the Antichrist, the one who's going to be over global government, etc. They do not know what they're talking about. They're ignorant about biblical history. They're ignorant about the past fulfillments of the prophecies. They're ignorant about Daniel chapter 11, and they're ignorant about this. And they're ignorant about Charles as well. So I'm going to address all those ignorances that I just mentioned. And let's start with the actual verse itself, the passage in Daniel 11. Can I can I also just like kind of throw a blanket yep. on on the people out there that are fired up right now? It's okay. <laughs> it's okay to be ignorant because look, like we're it all is. we're all ignorant in some way, shapes, or form. I just want to throw that yeah. throw it I, out there. I don't I don't know how electricity. I don't know how this computer's working right now. It just does. I'm I'm totally ignorant as to <laughs> technology. It's okay to be ignorant, and and I guarantee you, when it comes to biblical knowledge and understanding, we're all ignorant. I mean, we yeah. could study from the point in time that we grew up, Genesis through Revelation, and, and study up under the greatest scholars in the world, and we would still be ignorant to a yeah. lot of truth that's in Scripture. So go ahead, Tim. Tell, tell, tell us why we're ignorant. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've told you already, so I don't think you're ignorant anymore. You shouldn't be. But no, and, and, I, and I definitely share an this opinion. I share this opinion okay. with you, What, by the way, because I, I did re read in your book your reasoning behind it, and I definitely agree with you on this one, but I definitely want to hear you say it so other people can hear it. Okay, thank you. So, so people look at Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 8, and Daniel chapter 11, I'm going to skip over, or, uh, you know, this chapter. And they, and they, uh, they look at Daniel chapter 9 too, but I'm not going to address that one right here. And they conflate them. And by conflating, I mean they're mixing prophecies about different individuals and thinking they're about a particular individual. They're, they don't know about the history. So in Daniel chapter 11, we're dealing with the king of the north and the king of the south. And there are actually multiple ones traced through history in the prophecy. So you get up through Daniel chapter 11, verse 39. The whole prophecy up through verse 39 is already fulfilled historically. All of it is up through 39. Covering multiple kings of the north and multiple kings of the south historically. Now, the king of the north was of the Seleucid dynasty and the king of the south of the Ptolemaic dynasty. Those are the two major dynasties that came out of the breakup of Alexander the Great's empire. And so there were four dynasties that came out of that. Two of them were major. The king of the north called that because they were that the, uh, the ge geography of the territory that they controlled was more or less north of Israel. King of the south, because they were more or less south of Israel, centered in Egypt. So you had the Ptolemaic dynasty and the Seleucid dynasty. Antiochus IV Epiphanes, who desecrated the temple, the second temple in the second century BC, which led to its cleansing later, you know, led to the, what the Maccabees did, led to its cleansing later. Antiochus IV Epiphanes was one of these kings of the north addressed here in Daniel chapter 11, preceding the Romans coming into the promised land, okay? So you get all the way to the point of the Romans coming in the pro, into the promised land here toward the end of the chapter. 
Now, having said that it's fulfilled already through Daniel verse 39, verses 30 through 35 arguably could have a dual fulfillment. In other words, a future fulfillment. Verses 36 through 39 definitely do have a future fulfillment under a new king of the north. And that will be right before and in conjunction with the great tribulation beginning. So my first point is, this is already fulfilled in history. There is another fulfillment coming of another king of the north. The question is, is that Charles or is that the Antichrist is going to be over a global government? I'm going to say to you, no, it's not. And I'm going to come back to this prophecy on the desire of women here in a moment. But I want to point out that this king of the north that we're dealing with is the same as the little horn of Daniel chapter 8. Okay? People conflate the little horn of Daniel 8 with a little horn having a man's eyes of Daniel 7, when in reality they're two different little horns. They're not the same little horn, historically or prophetically. That little horn of Daniel chapter 8 is speaking of a king of the north from this prophecy in Daniel chapter 11. The little horn of the eyes of a man of Daniel chapter 7, which goes along with Revelation 13 and is speaking of the Antichrist is going to be over global government, is a different little horn and a different Antichrist is, is the head honcho, if you will, over the Antichrist of history. These kings of the north, a number of them were also Antichrists. And when we talk about this one, people are thinking, well, this should pertain to Charles. So the first point I want to make is, even if it was talking about homosexuality, no, it doesn't pertain to Charles. The most you can say is that Antiochus IV Epiphanes was a type of the Antichrist who's going to be over a global government in the future. He was a type, therefore, of Charles. You can go that far with it and you can say he's a type. And then you can ask the question, okay, is Charles a homosexual? Does he regard the desire of women? So my first point is this prophecy isn't specific to Charles. The second point is the desire of women is not about homosexuality at all. It never was in this prophecy. It's actually a title of the Messiah. It's a title that comes from the Hebrew Maseroth or the Zodiac before it was corrupt and corrupted and before God forbade Israel, ancient Israel, from having anything to do with astrology, which was based on the corrupted Zodiac. So that there is a title in the original Zodiac for the Messiah, which is the desire of women. And the reason that the Messiah is called that is because women from antiquity desired to bear the promised seed in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. That verse is known as the Proto-Evangel, the first uh, preaching of the gospel, if you will, in the Bible and scripture. There's a whole lot bound up in that one verse. It's called the Proto-Evangelium, Genesis 3, 15. And my series my Messiah History in the Tribulation Period series that I mentioned earlier, uh, there is an entire book on just the one verse in this series that because that one verse is so consequential to what follows in Scripture and all biblical history. So I won't go into that now, but I'll point it out. But anyway, the Messiah is the desire of women, and it goes back to that verse and then the Zodiac before we had written Scriptures. And the next point is there's a context to this desire of women because it tells us that this king of the north will not regard, uh, you know, the God of his fathers. And Hebrew is Elohim. It's God's Elohim plural in Hebrew. So you can translate that as God's plural or as God's singular. Nor the desire of women, nor regard any God. But instead, he's going to exalt himself above them all. And then in their place, it tells us, he will honor a God of fortresses. Now, this word fortresses in Hebrew can be translated as munitions or weaponry. So what it's telling us is that this king of the north is a military figure. He doesn't regard spiritual matters or gods, whether they're the real one or false ones. But instead, he regards weaponry, you know, as if it were a god, munitions. He regards warfare. So he doesn't regard the Messiah. He doesn't regard the real God. He doesn't regard false gods. He's into regarding, you know, what can he do with war and weapons? And, and that's and what it's telling. Different us. show for a different day. Uh, maybe when we, we, maybe if we can have another chat one day, me and John might be a little more. Uh, we might participate more in that one, although John certainly has more expertise. But, but that might even play into the fallen angels, the sons of God coming down, teaching daughters of men. You know, these these ancient. I believe a lot of our technological advances have been based on supernatural impartations. Uh, 
from you know to Nazis or or over in the past. But but would that be an example that it might correlate to to this this you know whoever the beast is? And I use the term beast, not Antichrist. Uh, I used your title for this show, but the mm -hmm. the ultimate beast of Revelation thirteen that he honors he honors his father Satan, the father of lies. Yes. Is that, would yeah. that tie in to what you're talking about with the God of fortresses, God of warfare type? Yeah, not, not exactly. This is a different character from Charles, another Antichrist in the last days. But the original you know, Antiochus IV who desecrated the temple was a strong type of Charles as the Antichrist. And Antiochus was one of the kings of the north in this chapter, Daniel 11, and also in Daniel chapter 8. So... He was the most important and consequential to Israel historically of all history of the kings of the north until you get down to verse 40 in Daniel 11. But, can, I uh, add, can I add a king of the north that you may not have thought of, but it, uh, Attila sure. the Hun, who controlled a vast amount of the world and actually right. controlled the Rome robe, paid tribute to him. Uh, at one time, they believed he was the Antichrist as well. His god of forces was the sword. Uh, much as you see in King Arthur's uh, sword in the hill or the sword in the stone, they worship the stone. They would sacrifice animals, massive amounts of animals to the sword that they would set up in the ground. And that was their God that they worshiped. And that's why a lot of stuff when you tie in King Arthur and, and Attila the Hun, it's it's almost identical. Same time period almost. Uh, and, and there's a lot of different stuff. But uh, that chivalry ideology is basically what the newfound kingships of England are founded on is this chivalric uh, mythology that it was uh, forged in the dark ages. And uh, interestingly enough, this is their God. And it, it kind of, you can kind of link that back to Mars and, and the God of Ma the Mars, the God of war. It's really interesting. And, yes. And, and that, that brings me, uh, I'm going to fast forward to the coronation. Uh, if you don't mind, I want to, before we go further, I want to make one point about this passage right. that I haven't finished. So the reason we got into this was people are saying Charles likes women, right? Right, right, right. Okay, that's their objection because they think that this prophecy is saying that the, the Antichrist is a homosexual and he's not going to desire women. So, well, Charles, you know, he's into Camilla in some rather disgusting ways and, you know, was obviously into Diana enough to have a couple children with her sons. You know, if you believe that they're her sons, I do. A lot of people don't. But regardless... Um, He's done it with women, right? Charles has. So that being said, if you want to be crass, it turns out that Charles has also done it with men and he's been caught doing it with men, even per Diana before she died. Hmm. He is a I sodomite. Love your terminology, it's like we're yeah. little, kids, little kids. Charles, <laughs> Charles is a sodomite. So. He's what you call a quote unquote bisexual. He's a sexual Satanist. And he's a lot of other things you know, in that, in that arena. And that is why he was close friends with Jimmy Seville, the most notorious pedophile and sexual Satanist in the history of the United Kingdom. You know, he's publicly known. That's why he was friends with, you know, an Anglican priest who, and I forget his name off the top of my head, sometimes I remember, sometimes I don't, who was like Seville, but not to the same degree, who was banning Charles' name about kind of as a defense, you know, when he was being uh, caught you know, by the authorities for what he was doing. Um, but the point is, Charles has kept company with people like Seville, you know, as advisors and close friends. How could he not know? Yeah, and I want to fast forward. Uh, I, I, I do want to go back into a little bit on the in the Commonwealth Games and imagery there. But from the coronation, what would you say mm -hmm. if you were going to like, take your top two examples from the coronation uh, to, to make a case or convince those that are skeptical that, that your understanding is correct. What would you say would be the top two or three things from the coronation or even the invitation that, that you would point to as far as ev additional evidence that obviously you didn't have when you wrote the book in 1998 and you delayed publication based on the coronation? What would you? Yeah, mean? let me let me put one thing in there before we answer that because there was something that happened before the coronation and after the first edition, the Antichrist and Cup Two was published, that is incredibly consequential, and then we'll go right into the coronation, and that's this statue. You remember this? Yes. Let me pull you it see up. This poor Scott. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this is an idol to Charles with his face 
standing on top of massive human bodies, looking up to him as Savior. And at the base of this statue is the inscription, Savior of the world. The, and he's portrayed as an angelic figure dressed only in a loincloth. This is Charles, and he's supposed to be hovering above this massive human bodies or crushing the head of one of them, depending on how you view it, but, you know, and, and whose interpretation you're reading. But this is the miniature version photographed by the BBC and presented to Charles by Tokentons, the, the uh, governor of Tokentons in central Brazil, after the Rio Earth Summit. And they were hailing Charles as the environmental savior of the world. Now, the same artist who produced this also produced a full-size version that is arguably 10 cubits in height and is sitting in a crate in a warehouse somewhere waiting to go atop the Temple Mount. You are looking at the idol wow. that is to be the desolating abomination. This is it right here. That's, this is the miniature version. That is, I, saw, I saw that in an interview you showed or you were the interview that I saw you, I saw you showing that and wow, what a, what a representation there. Um, you know, and there's a lot of people in the chat. There's, there's a lot of different ideas. Like, you know, it can't, you know, we're looking in the wrong direction, but I just want to say this for, because obviously so many people just can't understand how it's possible that it's not an American president or it's not this or not that, but what people don't realize that you haven't talked about yet, but that you do talk in your book about that I think is super relevant. And I think that everybody here needs to hear this, this, this bloodline of King Charles, which I've studied very, very closely over many years for several years, I've studied this closely and, and everything points to all of the bloodline of the Nephilim, the Knights of Lorraine, the Fisher Kings, the Merambinian bloodline, all of those go all the way towards the Tudors. And then eventually right into the kingship of the whales. And this is where the ultimate bloodline of uh, dark forces comes to. You have the divinic bloodline. You have the Muslim, the bloodline of Muhammad. You have uh, the bloodline of the Mongolians. You have Dracula. You have all of these bloodlines that converge into one specific bloodline here, making it very plausible that William or Charles, I'm sorry, could very well be the Antichrist. And, and I, and I just want to say this, just because our current understanding of Charles uh, may be a uh, frail old man or maybe whatever, this guy has uh, significant achievements. On top of that, the media has a way of being able to turn somebody from nobody to somebody in a, in a matter of moments. You know, we see the theater, the stage theater we're having. So it would be nothing for uh, Charles to come in and swoop and save the day, especially when he controls so many resources that are all over the entire world there's very many reasons that that charles is a very plausible uh representation and and from what tim's saying here he is the only possible um when it comes to the gematria the of his of his name he is the only possible candidate right now and and i believe that in order for in my personal opinion of the antichrist it has to be someone of kingly lineage that will be accepted by muslims and will be accepted by jews and will be accepted by christians and so uh he definitely fits those bloodlines to the t so i just want to interject that right now so that people that are like closed-minded to this maybe just even if you don't agree with it by in the broadcast just you know at least open up your mind to the idea that this is a firm possibility because if it is a possibility if you look at the way the stage is being set up right now, it makes a ton of sense. Like it makes so much sense. And, and that's well, what I was going to get into. Hold on, hold on one second. That's what I was going to get into with, uh, cause I know you part of the coronation, uh, mm -hmm. that I, I assumed you would get into is the bloodline and, and what happened behind mm -hmm. the, the wall. That's yes. that, that at least from your research, that's never happened before when, when he went behind the veil, uh, and was actually, um, I don't know what happened back there, but but there's a reason it was hidden from the world. So that was one of yeah. the things I wanted you to discuss in reference to the coronation. And per what John just brought out, this he he they are claiming whether it's true or not. OK, whether it's true or not, the royal family is claiming a direct lineage to King David. And you know, mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's true, but they're making that claim. Uh, also, you pointed it out just then, John, about about the Muslim connection. So, so Tim, maybe expand on that a little bit, a little bit more. Yeah. So Satan is called the prince of this world, and and the prince of the power of the air, right? For fallen mankind in the New Testament. 
Uh, the Antichrist in the case, and by the way, I want to be clear, Charles is not the, and this is, uh, anyone else can take any view they want to take. I'm taking the view because God showed me who the Antichrist is in 1987. He showed me. So, uh, and then led me to the evidence afterwards. I knew nothing about the British monarchy, nothing about royalty, nothing about any of the stuff that we've talked about when God showed me. So I was brand new to all of it. But that being said, uh, I'm saying Charles is the only candidate. He is the Antichrist. There's no possibility, literally, that it's anybody else. 100% Charles is it. Anybody who wants to argue with that, that's fine. Anybody who wants to say that Charles isn't it, well, you're going to have egg on your face because you're going to find out he is it, and you're going to have discredited yourself soon. You're going to find that out. So that being said, let's come back to this and then the lineage. I, there are some very important things about this statue that I address in the second edition of the Antichrist and Captain. Now this statue came out in the early 2000s, um, like years after the first edition of the Antichrist and Captain was published, okay? In Genesis chapter three, verse 15, it's the Messiah who crushes the head of the enemy, right? Who crushes the head of the serpent or the seed of the serpent. Now, there are collective seeds. There's God's seed, which is the church in Messiah. It's Christians in Messiah. And then there's the seed, which is Christ, you know, from God. Then there's the same thing on the other side of the aisle. You know, on the devil's side, there's Satan, you know, and his seed. And his the seed for him would be the Antichrist, the, the ultimate Antichrist of history, the one who's going to be over a global government throughout the period of the Great Tribulation. That's who Charles is. He is not the only Antichrist who's foretold in scripture in the last days. I mentioned there's going to be another king of the north. The first three horsemen of the apocalypse are also antichrists, but they're not the ones who are going to be over global government. That's Charles. Charles is the fourth horseman, and I'll come back to that. But back to this imagery for a moment. This is inverting Genesis 3.15. This is having the devil's seed, the antichrist, crushing the heads rather than God's seed, the Messiah, crushing the heads. So that's the first thing to notice. And Charles is being called literally Savior of the world. It's engraved on the base of the statue. It was reported on by the BBC when the statue was unveiled. This photograph was taken by the BBC originally. But another interesting thing is in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, when it talks about this prince of Roman lineage or this ruler, it can be a king. It can be translated king or ruler or prince, but it's a royal individual. Uh, who is you know, an individual who is of Roman lineage and royal, who is involved in imposing or enforcing, you know, often it's translated confirm in the, in the English of Daniel 9.27, a treaty or a covenant for a period of seven years in context. The Hebrew word translated as confirm is gabor, and it means to make strong or strengthen literally. And by implication, it is accurately translated as impose, or enforce. So it's stronger than just confirming, in other words. The name Charles and people, you can, you'll, if you look this up and you don't find it, don't write and say, well, Tim's right. Charles doesn't mean what he says it means. In fact, it does. And I give the sources in the second edition of the Antichrist in a cup of tea. The name Charles literally means strong man or to make strong. In other words, it has almost an identical meaning, if not the identical meaning, to the Hebrew word Gabor. So Charles' name is insinuated or implied, if you will, in Daniel 9.27. And what makes that a whole lot stronger is the root words of Daniel 9.27, and I break it down and I show this in the second edition of the Antichrist in the Cup of Tea, specifically describe this particular statue. Without spread wings, dressed only in a loincloth, associated with the name Charles. This statue is what's described in Daniel 9.27 in the root words. And you will not get that from your English translation. So I go through the Hebrew root, root words and all of that in the second edition of the Antichrist and Cup of Tea. So it's fascinating then, of course, that this came out years after the first edition of the book and that there's a full-size version. And the reason 10 cubits is significant is the two cherubim, the two statues that were on either side of uh, the Ark of the Covenant in Solomon's temple, the, uh, not Solomon's, the second temple, uh, were 10 cubits in height each, according to the Old Testament, those angelic statues. This statue, the full-size version, is ready-made to go into a newly constructed holy place. 
atop the Temple Mount in Israel. That's the reason it's the height that it is. So, so having said that, we'll now go to the coronation and your questions, um, Scott. And we're talking about his coronation as king on May 6th. And we'll talk yeah, about you, his lineage. Uh -huh. Yeah, briefly, I mean, again, the the stone that they claim was Jacob's stone, uh, the anointing oil. I'm, I'm just trying to like hit the highlights. I know you've done a, a, a detailed interview with Janie Duvall, if any of uh, if any of John's audience is interested in where that's fine. I think you put it on your channel, too, but but maybe mm -hmm. just hit the highlights of uh, sort of uh, may, maybe your top three, top five type moments uh, from what we're seeing and, and, and why you why you are <laughs> dogmatic. Let's just say it on, on Charles being the Antichrist. So if you had like well, pick your top five best examples or evidence, let's say you're writing a things, link. <laughs> what I showed so far, uh, the imagery of that first beast of Revelation 13, the name calculation. Right. In Hebrew and English, and then the statue that we just saw. Yeah, I'm those talking about the, the top three. specifically. Uh, okay, but those are the top three biblically. Okay. And, and those things alone make Charles the Antichrist. You don't need the statue to know that. But, but there is no possibility that he isn't the Antichrist from those three things. There is much more, and there's more than what I shared with Janie in our interview, because you can't get it all into one interview. You know, so for example, you know, those who go and watch that interview with Janie and then watch this, here's something I'll share with you that I didn't get to share in that interview with Janie, just didn't get to it. Uh, the robes that the Anglican Protestant priests were wearing, including the Archbishop of Canterbury, was wearing for Charles' coronation on May 6th, were all furnished by the Roman Catholic Church. That's what Including I found. Like, that's one of the things I found. It's like it's like Rome and and the Anglican uh, Church. I even hate to call it that. It's, it's like they're they're coming back together, and that's there's been many comments in chat on my in my channel and which I don't, I don't have very people watching, but on John's channel about you know identifying obviously the Pope and the Vicar who is no doubt an Antichrist. Uh, but but yeah, I, I found that fascinating. Uh, not only was Rome involved. Catholicism, but you also had the Sikhs. You had you had different faiths, different leaders of faiths presenting Charles with various royal. I don't know how to describe them, like like a scepter or different different things, bracelets, things of that nature. You had for the first time ever, at least uh, that we know about, where these other faiths are involved in the ceremony in the crowning of of the king of england which i found that fascinating and especially that he wanted to be defender of the faith like this this multinational all faith religion which we know is anti christ that in and of itself is anti christ because all three of us would 100% lie and we are saved solely by yeshua solely by jesus christ and his blood and, and we might differ on some eschatology and some other things, but on that, we all align. But I found that fascinating, Tim, that, that what was happening in the coronation. Yeah, so Charles is a liar, and I'll circle back to, around to that in terms of the, the title that you brought up in a moment. Um, yeah, so it was the first time that other religions and you know non-christians participated in any ascension to the throne for the british monarchy in recorded history and the current ceremony ostensibly goes back about 1100 years more than a thousand years and since the anglican protestant church was formed since the schism with rome happened you know under henry the eighth there was never a time until this coronation that the Ang that uh, Roman Catholics were permitted to participate, and in fact, a Roman Catholic Archbishop participated in Charles' coronation May sixth as well. Uh, very significant things happened, but he destroyed the whole thing in one fell swoop. If you go back to his mother's coronation in nineteen fifty three, and let me just show her. This was her invitation from nineteen fifty three. You had her coat of arms at the top, her heraldic achievement. And then you had the primary symbols that were used in the coronation, the sword of state, 
the phoenix that's what this is you know they a lot of pundits not knowing what it is think it's a strange looking bird and they call it an eagle or or dove but it's neither of those it's a phoenix the orb with the cross atop it the golden orb the crown which is the state crown but they also have saint edward's crowns they they use both crowns at the investure at any rate during her ceremony uh, nothing was behind a veil in terms of you know like what was done for charles it was public P the public could hear what was being said those who attended and for those who could watch a recording of it later and the uh, everything that was said was biblical really more or less uh with one exception and that is she was officially crowned queen of thy people israel quote unquote and that's on her official lineage you know, the British monarchy officially claims and has for more than a century, uh, at least in writing, to sit upon David's throne. They claim to be the monarchy of Israel today. It's an official claim that they make. So we'll come back to that uh, when we talk about Charles and his coronation. You can look at Charles' invitation and you see none of that. You don't see the symbols that were given to him in the coronation here. And the same symbols were used for him as for his mother in 1953, right? You don't see those on here. Instead, it's filled with paganism. It's filled with all kinds of amazing paganism. But the most significant thing, you know, I'll run through a few things here and then we'll talk about the coronation itself. This is a version of Charles' uh, state heraldic achievement as king. The difference between the state one and his personal one as king is it lacks the gold helm right here. The, it's called the sovereign helm beneath the crown. That's missing. That's the state version. This is Camilla's state heraldic achievement. You'll notice she has boars on hers. Yeah, Charles has the unicorn with human eyes still. She has boars. You'll notice these devices, the unicorn, the lion, leopard, bear, and you can't tell that this is a lion, leopard, bear, beast from this invitation. You have to look at his, excuse me, his heraldic achievement as Prince of Wales for that. But these devices are elsewhere on the invitation. So here's the boar. I'm circling it. Here's the lion, leopard, or lion, leopard, bear. I'm circling it. Here's the unicorn. I'm circling it. The bee is here for the Jacobites, historically. You've got... You know, the thistle and other things for Scotland and Ireland and England. I won't go into those here. And then you've got the green mountain head. Oh, and by the way, a butterfly symbolizing resurrection right here. And then you have the green mountain head, the most prominent symbol on this invitation right here. And I have a larger version of it, but I'll show this. This, you'll notice there is uh, foliage. Foliage, I often mispronounce that, growing out of its mouth right here, signifying that it's the head of a corpse, okay, with its eyes open, you know, dead and alive at the same time. Another version of resurrection. And the green man, the mythology surrounding this pagan symbol, includes death and resurrection. So Antichrist symbolism. You'll notice it has a crown of thorns on its head, right? Right here. Mm -hmm. tying into the theme of death. And then it's got the devil's horns hidden in foliage right here, or foliage. Yeah, they didn't do a good job hiding it, though. Well, you have to kind of look before you know, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you got to know what you're looking for. But when I first saw yeah. that, I'm like, man, that is, that is satanic to its core. It is. And you got the acorn here in lieu of a crown, right? Or and I don't know, what, what's the symbolism say. by the acorn, Tim? I, I, I don't, maybe John recognizes it. I don't, I don't just know. Just more, yeah, just more paganism. Nothing that adds to what I'm sharing already. So, but the point is, I concluded more than a decade ago that Charles is the grand, the green man of paganism, this neo-paganism. I had already drawn that conclusion, already written about that in the second edition of the Antichrist and the Cup of Tea, the draft, which I started to do. Uh, back in 2008 to write it, you know, to revise it and update it. Uh, I'd already drawn that conclusion. And so for Charles to throw this with the crown of thorns on it, you know, as the major symbol for his coronation, 
tells you an awful lot, including that he is anti-Christian to the core and satanic. Oh. And 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 it gets into this eco-fascism. The the what, what we're what we anybody that has half a brain right now sees what's happening with the uh, climate agenda and what they're trying to push. And and again, your argument is Charles is behind it all. He's really the driving force ultimately behind. Like like you said earlier, he would be the head of Freemasonry, the head of the secret societies, uh, and everything kind of traces back to him. Now, I would I would put Rome into this equation majorly, but I think we actually, even though we I may I'm not 100 percent on board about Charles, but I, I think we both. And, and I'm not sure where John stands on this. As far as the vicar, the current pope or a future pope, I think that's the best candidate for a false prophet, the second beast. But and, and, and we do see we do see the crown, the Holy Roman Empire merging back in politically, uh, spiritually together. That That's that's the thing I thought was most significant about it is we're seeing Rome and 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 the crown of England, the Commonwealth of England, British Empire, starting to come back together. Well, Charles has met with the popes on multiple occasions, going back to John Paul II. And usually when he did so, he was dressed all in black. And actually, the same thing with the Queen and Prince Philip. And one of the interesting things about that is all three of them, the Queen, Charles, and Philip, wore their garter, that garter belt that's around the center of Charles' heraldic achievement as Prince of Wales that I showed you. Uh, and this is the, the order of the garter also, the belt right here. But it's oh, cut off. It the they, they bent at the top, okay? There we go. For the, for the chivalry. But, uh, but they wore that belt, you know, either on uh, an elbow or below the knee, uh, where it's worn by men versus women, because they were, they were pushing the order of the garter before the Pope. So you've got the papacy and the Vatican under the Pope, then you've got the, the uh, Jesuits and so forth, right? On that side, that's a whole power base uh, in its own right, you know, in, in pulling the strings of the world and globalists and so forth. That's a whole power base in its own right. And then you've got the British monarchy and the order of the garter, as well as multiple other orders of chivalry under them. But the most prominent one being the order of the garter and literally the entire new world order has been built up beneath the order of the garter historically over multiple centuries. So there's a lot, an awful lot that ties into the order of the garter historically. Freemasonry is just one thing. And by the way, the way that Freemasonry works, I told you I'd mention how that works in this interview. The United Grand Lodge of England, it, historically, it had a, a different name originally, but the United Grand Lodge of England is the lodge, historically, in which the blue degrees, which are common to both the York Rite and Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, originated. So the first three degrees of Freemasonry, known as the blue degrees, originated in, the, in that lodge. And for that re reason, whoever is the Grand Master of that lodge is considered to be the highest ranking Freemason in the world. Now, typically that's been, uh, for example, the Duke of Kent, you know, related to the British monarchy, one of their, their uh, relatives. Uh, Charles was offered uh, that Grand Mastership and turned it down. He's not interested in being a Freemason. He has no need to be a Freemason to be over Freemasonry globally. The reason for that is that the Grand Master of that lodge is a knight in the Order of the Garter and always has been. You know, since that lodge has existed and the Order of the Garter has existed. And there are 24 companion knights in the Order of the Garter who are under the British monarch and the Prince of Wales of the day. So they each have 12 companion knights. Uh, and because the the Grand Master of the United Grand Lodge of England is a knight under Charles, you know, even as Prince of Wales, that was the case now also under Prince William. Both Charles and Prince William today are over Freemasonry globally by virtue of how that works. And they don't have to be Freemasons for that to be the case. But as it turns out, the, the, uh, the Order of the Garter has also been the core leadership and remains the core leadership to this day of the Priori of Zion, the Knights Templar, the Temple Knights, the Rosicrucians, uh, the modern Illuminati, including, you know, under Adam Weishaupt, uh, uh, Freemasonry, the modern international banking system, the modern international 
news system, the fake news media. They're all tied in. Uh, the Committee of 300 tied into the Order of the Garter. If you've heard of that with uh, John Coleman wrote a book titled The Committee of 300, where he goes into quite a bit of amazing, th quite a few amazing things in that book and, and a bunch of other things, but all tied in under the Order of the Garter. And by the way, organized witchcraft and organized Satanism globally, meaning formal witchcraft and formal Satanism, and also formal druidry, but particularly witchcraft and Satanism, are also under the order of the garter historically. So the garter itself has two rows of 169 miniature gold buckles each that, that look a bit like a chain, but they're all gold buckles, horseshoe-shaped buckles. Two rows, 169 each, and they, they line the inner and the outer edges of the garter, the real garter. Each of those buckles represents a coven of witches and witchcraft, 13 witches. So when you get into uh, a coven of covens, that individual is known as a witch king or a witch queen. Because there's 169, it's 13 times 13 times 13 for both the British monarch and the Prince of Wales of the day, symbolized by that garter. So what it's effectively saying to the occult world is that the British monarch is a witch king of witch kings or a witch queen of witch queens in the case of Elizabeth II before she died. And the same thing with the Prince of Wales. Is a witch king of witch kings or a witch queen, uh, which, well, only could be a witch king of witch kings in the case of the Prince of Wales, because that person can only be a male. But, but at any rate... Uh, there are so many things tied into the Order of the Garter, and that's the reason for its prominence on Charles' heraldic achievement and, and as the symbolism of the first beast of Revelation 13. So coming back to uh, the lineage now and this coronation, you know, I mentioned that Satan is the prince of the power of the air. He's the prince of this world biblically, you know, before he's put down by, by the Lord at Armageddon. As it turns out, Prince Charles, and this is true of William and Harry as well, descends from practically every lineage that was of consequence in the history of the world ever. That's what John descends from, Yeah, descends from the Assyrian uh, monarchs, the Babylonian monarchs of ancient Assyrian, ancient Babylonia, the Roman emperors, multiple emperors, uh, ancient Egyptian pharaohs, uh, all the royal houses of Europe, Mah uh, Muhammad, you know, of the Muslims, he's the Hashemite lineage is con the lineage from their false prophet, Muhammad, known as the Hashemite lineage. So Jordan's King Hussein is of that lineage. Iraq Saddam Hussein, before he was killed, was of that lineage. Prince Charles, now King Charles III, is also of that lineage. They are looking for their Mahdi, you know, their, their, their version of a Messiah, if you will, Islam is, particularly a Shia or Shiite Islam, which is what Iran represents is looking for its Mahdi to come from that Hashemite lineage. Charles is of that lineage. He's one of the, the individuals in the world who can be a shoe in if you will, for the Mahdi or where they don't want that. Now, Charles is the most prominent Westerner from the entire world, bar none, to the Muslims of the Middle East. He has no competition in that regard. He has an honorary doctorate in Islamic studies from the seat of Islamic learning, the most prominent seat of Islamic learning, in this case, Sunni Islamic learning in Cairo, Egypt. So he also converted behind the scenes to Islam under a guardian of Islam, one of the most prominent uh, Muslim uh, uh, clerics in the world. So Charles to the Muslims of the Middle East is a Muslim. He has a doctorate in Islamic studies and he's of the Hashemite lineage and he's unifying the world's religions. And when we talk about Rome, Charles has been working for decades. That's the reason I mentioned his uh, meetings with the popes. He's been working for decades to bring the Anglican Protestant communion back under the papacy. He wants that. Even though he's the head now, titular head on earth, of the Anglican communion. Now, can you imagine, I've mentioned this in some interviews, the Antichrist, who's going to be possessed by Satan, being the head of the Anglican communion, for so long, Protestants have thought that the Antichrist would come out of the Roman papacy, that the Pope would be the Antichrist, or that the Vatican represented the Antichrist. Now, there are multiple Antichrists biblically. I was going to say they do. They, no doubt they do. But again, we're talking about there were, there were Antichrists that John was writing about in, in 1 John. Antichrist spirit and Antichrist have always been around, and that's that's 
and 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 yes, I believe our reformed uh, the reformed brothers that uh, in the fifteen and sixteen hundreds they were spot on when they called the Pope in Rome Antichrist. Uh, yes. But what you're saying, there's going to be a few, which I'll use the term beast, but there's going to be a future ultimate final fulfillment at the end of this age. And that's obviously that's your case as it's Charles. So there's not just one antichrist. You well, know, I know, I'm talking about the future and, final yeah. beast of Revelation 13 again. And that's yes, why that's I like to use that term as opposed to antichrist, because it can get confusing when you start saying antichrist. Well, shoot, the, you know, M Muslims that deny Christ would be by definition antichrist so would hindus so would atheists of course they yes. would be antichrist. Mm -hmm. yes yeah and communist leaders like uh, king kim jong-un he's certainly an antichrist to his population lenin right? stalin etc yep. right you know and let me just point this out and i'll come back to this since we're talking about multiple antichrists for a moment i'll just point out something that people can see uh on my youtube channel and actually i don't need to minimize that necessarily let's go to this so my youtube channel is author tim con right here on this channel i share a presentation uh, that i gave to a church and that presentation can be found under this play, uh, excuse me, um, yeah, this playlist, The Foretold Antichrist and the Mark of the Beast. People go to this playlist and they look for the blue horse outside Denver International Airport in an icon, Lucifer, right here. Mm -hmm. This presentation is titled, Is King Charles III the Antichrist over multiple antichrists? In this presentation, I point out evidence for Barack Obama being the rider of the white horse potentially, or Biden or abomination, that combination. Obama appears to be one of the antichrists we're told in scripture, but he's not the one who's going to be over a global government. I also identify the other horsemen in this presentation. So my book, North Korea, Iran and the Coming World War, identifies the, the horsemen for the second seal, the fiery red horse. I go into the others in this. Charles is the fourth horseman, but I, I address the first and the third in this. And the fact that the third one is not a black horse in reality, it's actually Lucifer. Lucifer is the precise coloration for that third horse, uh, for the third horseman. So people can go watch that. They can see some of the evidence. I have a separate book coming on that, but there's enough in this presentation for people to understand uh, that even though Obama may be an antichrist, you know, and people have reason for thinking that biblically, He's not the one who pertains to Revelation 13. He is not the one who will be over global government. And in fact, Obama reports to Prince Charles and now King Charles III and has all this time. Biden reports to him right now, still. So when we think, for example, that the coup happened in 2020 because you know, of people working for the Democrat Party in this country and under Biden, et cetera, and now it's coming out that the FBI, the Federal Bureau of uh, Instigation and the Department of <laughs> Injustice were heavily involved in all that. Well, there's other information that ties it into the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA. And then also back to MI5 and MI6, the United Kingdom. And guess where it all traces ultimately? To Charles. So what's happened to President Trump ultimately has been done under Charles. And I address that separately, not, uh, I do a little bit in the second edition of the Antichrist of Captivity, but I've got another book coming that goes into a lot more detail. Well, so one thing too, is, one thing too that I would say, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say one thing too, that I think that, that, you know, you, you didn't say that you did say in your book is about the idea that of course you're, you're mentioning that he has control over lots of the world, but also land mass wise over a quarter of the earth, um, is in control through the United Kingdom. They control over one quarter of the nations of the earth uh, in the yeah. world. And that's something interesting as well. Yeah. When the first edition of the book came out in 1998, it was 53 nations. And at that time, Israel had already been invited to join the British Commonwealth. Not a lot of people know that. Israel was already asked if they wanted to join back then. And that's in the first edition of my book. I mentioned that. 
There's now further talk about both Israel and the so-called Palestinians through the PA, uh, the Palestinian Authority, joining the British Commonwealth. They've been invited. They're discussing it. Um, well, it only makes yet. sense since Rothschilds are the ones that purchased the land, Palestinian land, and uh, they were all all up in the business of getting Israel going. I mean, you know, the, that's the thing that I think a lot of people feel. They're like, there's no way Israel will accept Charles, but Charles is of that lineage. And on top of that, there is um, ample evidence to show um, who purchased Israel and who controls the, the purse strings of Israel. Um, and I, and I've, I've documented that in several um, lectures. It's pretty amazing. But um, Israel itself, may, maybe they haven't said we're going to be a part of that. Uh, when it, in fact, you know, their symbolisms right there on the Israeli court, you see the Illuminati symbolism on there. So to say that they're not involved in this in some way, shape or form, I think would be false. Well, in uh, fact, that symbolism is there because the Rothschilds demanded it as part yeah. of, you know, paying for all of that. And talking, uh, about the, talking about the parent, we don't have a, a screenshot, but what they're talking about is, um, is a pyramid, uh, sitting on top of the Israeli Supreme court and, and, there's an mm -hmm. all seeing eye hovering above it. They just kind of, yeah. they tried to semi hide it, but they didn't do very, very good completely, job. completely Illuminati and satanic. And the Nesset too, part of that, if I remember right, was funded also by the Rothschilds Yeah, the Nesset building. But I don't know, are you aware, John, that the Rothschilds had married into the British monarchy? Did you know that? I am aware of that. Also, Schwab yeah. is also related to the Rothschilds. It's a big, yes. big, big little family, isn't it? That's correct. <laughs> Schwab is a Schwab is a Rothschild. Exactly. Fact. Yes. And and uh, you know, Eric Klaus, who all he all he needs is a little kitty cat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good Bond villain, right? Yeah. Oh, he's a perfect. Like I mean, perfect Bond like they couldn't have, they couldn't have cast a better person to be the front man for the for the. Uh, for the yeah. uh, and you've all know a Harari can be a stooge, mm. so. That guy. But, uh, yeah. Man. Anyway, um, Diana, uh, a lot of people think that her father was not the individual who has been, you know, popularized, um, you know, as her father, but that her father was a Rothschild. And hmm. Kate, her mother is a Rothschild, William's wife's. So William's grandmother is a Rothschild. So... Hmm. There have been other points prior to that, too, when the Rothschilds married into the family. But mm -hmm. that being said, when we talk about the po the proportion of the earth under the British monarchy, there were 53 nations, roughly a quarter of the world's population when the first edition was published. There are now 56 nations and 72 territories among those nations that are part of the Commonwealth, comprising ostensibly one third, roughly, of the world's population today. And... So when I talk about, and, and I have a whole chapter dedicated to the uh, the Commonwealth Games of 2022, which we'll circle back around to, uh, and the representation of the Commonwealth there. But those nations of the Commonwealth that explicitly say the British monarchy is their monarchy, and most of the nations don't, but I think it's 13 or 14 nations at this point that do you know, hold that the British monarchy is their monarchy, including, for example, Canada, New Zealand, Australia. Um, still, uh, and of course the United Kingdom, but those nations that do hold that, per the legalese, if you will, technically, the crown, which now belongs to Charles, the crown owns all of their resources, all of their land, all of it, and their population are the subjects of the crown. Those people in those nations don't realize that technically they don't own anything. And when you look at it from that perspective, that would make the crown orders of magnitude more wealthy than all the billionaires and trillionaires of the world combined. Wow. And, you know, another interesting um, bloodline fact, and I'm sure you've looked into this. If, and if you have, I'm interested to hear a little bit about it. So I've I've noticed that the Romanoff bloodline, which was the and you you know this, but for those that are listening, it was. Uh, one of the monarchs of Russia in Petersburg before the Bolshevik Revolution, before they were cast out. And the Romanovs were probably one of the most powerful uh, family, Russian families of all time. Now, the Romanovs, 
Um, the the King Charles actually has Romanov blood. He's the first king to have Romanov blood uh, within the kingship in a very long time, which would put his uh, right to rule over Russia uh, in, I guess, in play at, at a certain point. And I don't know if you've read the prophecies in Second Estrus about the three headed eagle, uh, but there's a three headed eagle, and it was mentioned in Second as Second Ezra as being the di- vision that Daniel also saw, uh, but seen in a little bit more detail. And if you look in history, the first representation, in fact, the only representation of a three headed eagle is Romanoff uh, family's uh, eagle. And then, of course, the two-headed eagle plays a big part in second estrus as well because there's one eagle's head that kind of goes into the red as and then there's two eagles. And then it it explains the beast in a very detailed way, but in, in, in a way of an eagle, a three-headed eagle, a two-headed eagle at one point, and it has all these different feathers that come off of it. And it's so interesting because that – that is the heraldry of Rome. If you look at it, it's like, okay, this is clearly the heraldry of Rome, but you also have Russia. You have uh, many yeah, European said, nations that have that have that Germanic. symbolism. Yeah, Germanic. That, German, Germany and Rome have the same heraldry, by the way. Yeah, that, uh, that eagle symbolism actually goes back to Babylonia, and the United yeah. States oh, has it, it more than anyone. Right, I like yeah. to say, Tim, yeah. real quick, I like to say all roads and John, all roads just make a pit stop in Rome. They ultimately... Well lead back to Babylon. I mean, Rome was just, uh, you know, a, a more recent manifestation of mystery Babylon. Well, let me, let me add a few points. I'll start with yours, Scott, on Babylon. Uh, a lot of people, including prophecy, quote unquote, scholars have talked mm-hmm. about and written about a revived Roman empire, you know, in the last days out of the antichrist and, you know, never went away. The, a revived Roman Empire, and that the global government under the Antichrist would be the ultimate representation of that. That's actually incorrect. There's no such thing biblically as a revived Roman Empire. The Roman Empire never ceased to exist. It split exactly. up into East and West, and it simply morphed into the nations that we know today. It's never gone away. What does revive biblically is Babylonia, the ancient Babylonian Empire, and it's a global system under the Antichrist, and that is the entire reason that the hidden capital you know, of the global government under the Antichrist is called Mystery Babylon you know, in the book of Revelation, in the Apocalypse. But it's also separate from the beast. And clearly in Revelation, uh, in Revelation where it talks about the whore riding on the back of the beast, uh, it mentions the ten horns hating the whore, and they threw it off the back of the beast and burn it. And then as they did this, they, give, they were given power, and then they gave power directly to satan himself to the beast and so you know there has to be well, that to the antichrist they're going to give their power to charles right but i'm what i'm saying is what satan. i'm saying is babylon is a separate entity than the beast clearly yes. in, in prophecy and so and, but they do have control over the beast for a very long time in fact i think we see it through our monetary policy right now and that's why you see an overthrow taking place of monetary uh, the, how the money works in general, you see a complete overthrow of that. So uh, I just just wanted to throw that out there to see to see what you thought about that, because, you know, when you see the beast itself, this beast is an empire that, uh, at least according to Second Estrus and Daniel, even is just a be- an empire that is kind of consistently there in the backdrop, consistently there, consistently coming. One time it comes forth as a as this part of it comes forth as that part of it, whether it's the bear, or the leopard. But in the end time, beast it seems to be a representation of all of those empires combined together into one major empire uh first controlled by babylon but then after babylon's thrown off its back controlled directly by satan do i do i have that's what i believe what do you think about that that's that would be my understanding yeah so okay i gotta unpack that a little bit so (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> We're going to get a 30 yeah. minute answer. So, yeah, you know, I mean, I'll try to be succinct so that people can follow and understand. <laughs> so, the throwing off of um, Babylon by the beast or the woman that rides the beast, the harlot of Revelation, the throwing off occurs in an hour where she's burned in one hour of one day and destroyed. The harlot right. is, right? Okay. That's at the very end of the tribulation week. Up until that happens, she's riding the beast, and riding has multiple connotations, including fornicating with the beast. 
So, and I mentioned there are two power bases, right? There's the Vatican, you know, with the Jesuits and so forth, their priesthood. And then there's the British monarchy with the Order of the Garter and the other order, orders of chivalry under them and all this stuff built up under both spheres. So naturally, Charles wants to unite the two and bring the Anglican Protestant Church back under the Vatican. And meanwhile, the Pope has partnered with Charles for his climate agenda, has signed on to the seven-year agreements from the COP Accords at the United Nations on behalf of the Vatican and is pushing the same eco-fascist agenda as Charles, all being done under Charles. The Pope has signed on to multiple things related to Mother Earth worship, in fact, and this Pope, Francis, has even pushed to a degree sexual Satanism, which is heavily pushed under Charles, but indirectly. People don't realize Charles is at the top of that. It wasn't just, I mean, Charles is a Seville-like character and people don't know it. Let me put it that way. Go read about Jimmy Seville and you'll get an idea of what I'm talking about. So, so that being said, um, yeah, there's a reason that he was close to Jimmy Seville and people like that. But... Um, yeah, so when we're, when we're distinguishing Babylon from the beast, the two are partnered up until the end, up until the point where the woman is burned with fire. Yeah. And when we're talking about the seat of the government, Mystery Babylon, I've argued, and people can see this in one of the presentations I did or interviews, I should say, with Janie Duvall, where I argued that it could be you know, New York or Rome or London, that you can make good arguments biblically and historically for all three. But I think that the strongest argument is for New York City. And having said that, one of the things that I point out, uh, you know, apart from the obvious, you know, that the United Nations is there, the World Trade Center is there, those kinds of things, you know, in their own territory that are separate from the United States diplomatically. Apart from pointing that out, you know, with regard to the United Nations, the Statue of Liberty is there. And the Statue of Liberty was explicitly the goddess of Babylon, historically. That's what it was made to be. And the French renamed it because they knew that the United States, having a fair number of Christians in it early on, would reject it if the United States was offered the goddess of Babylon for New yeah. York Harbor, right? Yeah. And so they renamed it the Statue of Liberty. So you have a harlot right there saying, come on to me with a torch and all that. Yeah, and you have the center of world trade and all these things happening there in New York City that very closely, if not perfectly, matches Mystery Babylon as described in Revelation. The only component that could be argued to be missing a bit is the spiritual piece. And I think that comes with Rome and the Roman Catholic Church. So it's very likely. And you could view. also you could mm -hmm. also make the argument too that it, it doesn't represent a city at all, but in a control mechanism since it's it's writing on top of the beast, you know, if, if you're riding a beast, ultimately you're, you have the bridle in its mouth, you're controlling its direction. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, I totally get what you're saying. I've thought the same thing. Like it could be, it could like literally there's interpretations of some of the church fathers that Jerusalem itself was mystery Babylon. Um, and, and because of the, you know, uh, because of the actual harlotry uh, talked about in the Bible and actual, the cup, a cup of abominations being mentioned in, Ezekiel and mentioned in other uh, passages as well. So like there's been a lot of cities, but if you think about and and a, in fact, like that's one of the first uh, beliefs that Jerusalem was in fact mystery Babylon. But let's say you'll say it's not an actual city and it's a purse string, you know, it's controlling the purse string because ultimately we know what runs this world. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. This is how they control politicians. It's how they can control actors. This is how they set up the world stage. Um, so I, I feel like that argument can made, be made for that as well. I, what do you think about that? Well, real quick, my, mm -hmm. hold on, Tim. Let me let me give my thoughts on this. I look at Mystery Babylon, John, as she wears many dresses. In other words, mm -hmm. she might wear a Jewish dress. She might wear a Muslim dress. She might wear a Jehovah Witness or a Mormon mm -hmm. or a Scientism or atheism. She doesn't care how how she gets you in bed with her. It would be any anything other than truth. And I think right like right now, and I know uh, from listening to you, John, we are to come out of her. We're to come out of anything that reeks of any false religion. And and let's just be honest, uh, a lot certain parts of Christianity are still in bed with 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 Mama Rome. I mean, they just are. And yeah. and. 
certain practices by the Christian church, even the protesting daughters and the Protestants, that is, I would say that is mystery Babylon, you know, Easter, Christmas. Uh, it's not yeah. just the Muslims. It, it, it's, this, it's this false religion, and she doesn't care how she gets you. She wants to keep you in the, in the, in the room. And if and I'm so right, I look at Mr. Babylon, certainly a financial component, but from a spiritual component, mm -hmm. that's that's how I view it. And it certainly includes D.C. It includes London. It includes Tokyo. It no yeah. doubt includes Jerusalem and London and, and et cetera. Well, what I was getting at too, I was I, I want to be clear about what I was saying too, because I want to make sure because I know I do know the prophecy does state it is a city. It says this is a city. I know that for a fact, but I, at the same to token, uh, when I when I think of this, and I'm just trying to put it the best way that I think of it, I think of a a system, a beast system, a beast. Let, let me just let's just describe it exactly how it's described in Revelation. There, you got this seven headed dragon with a bunch of horns on it. And it's playing. It's it is the control mechanism. It is the beast system all wrapped into one, and eventually into one person, right? And through time, you have a, a city, obviously a city who stands in control over this. But it's also not just a city, but it's a control. It has to be a control mechanism of some sort. So not just a city, but also a control mechanism in order to keep all the moving parts going. And and I and I guess you know your your idea of New York is probably one of the better ideas of that. But London's also like got a huge power source for money as well. Like I guess they're considered and and, and I know you said Toronto. I think Toronto uh, is a huge one. But like you said, yeah, I think right. I agree with both of you in a way. I'm just trying to kind of be clear. I want to I want to let me know. I know that the Bible does say it's a city by by far. I know I know that it says that, but um. I, do you think that that city also has to be connected with the purse strings of the entire world? Okay. So first of all, it is literally a city, right? And it's called mystery because it's hidden. It's not obvious to most people, but when you talk about the nature of that city, you know, with what's written there in revelation, that city, once the global government is constituted, you know, well, the global government will have its seat of power as it were in that city. But there are multiple components. You know, there's the economic component, the military component, the uh, spiritual component, you know, et cetera, right? It's all merged, you know, under that global governance, you know, under the Antichrist and the false prophet. And uh, so it has global reach is the way I would prefer to say it, you know, with tentacles everywhere. Right. Yeah, and that would make sense, though, even yeah. with Jerusalem. The idea, have you ever considered the Jerusalem like Hippolytus and a couple of the uh, church fathers had suggested? Have you considered that as well? Yeah, I think that's uh, a very false interpretation and, and borders on blasphemy, in my view. Why, why do you um, think? But why yeah. Why would you say that, though? Like, can you, can yeah. you give a re reason that why you would and believe that? And it's a popular even... view, even a, it's a popular view among multiple people at this point, even some people I respect. It was the yeah, first yeah. view, just to mind you, it was the first view of the church fathers, well, even the Jewish, Ezekiel, Jewish church fathers. What about Ezekiel 23? And again, uh, it calls the house of Israel well, and the house yeah. of Judah. Let me, well, Tim, let me get a word in. It calls yes. in Ezekiel 23, it's calling the cities, Samaria and Jerusalem, harlots. So you do have scriptural evidence where not yes. only Jerusalem, but also the apostate northern kingdom that quickly went apostate, created their own feast days, created their uh, created idolatry, established their own priesthood. And you uh -huh. have these two sisters that are actually called harlots. And then to John's point, and I, I'm, I'm and I'm don't I never want to throw Judah or a Jew under the bus, but at the upper levels. We just talked about the Supreme Court earlier and the upper echelons of Judaism. They are just as in bed with this occult uh, mystery Babylon religion as anything. And I will say this. No prophet, at least when John wrote this, no prophet was killed in New York City. No prophet uh, was necessarily killed in Rome. It was always Jerusalem, Judah, Israel that killed the prophets. And again, yep. we're talking about a false apostate religion, which, you know, everybody can point a finger at Roman Catholicism and see what they did. They just dusted off what Jeroboam did. They installed their own priesthood. They created their own feast days, their own holy days, and they set up blatant idolatry.
I mean, that's yep. exactly what Rome did. The apple didn't fall far from the tree as far as when it, when we trace it back to uh, Jeroboam and what his three sins were. And, I, and I'm not contradicting any of that. Here's what I'm saying. Uh, you know, if we want to talk about what the Bible says, and obviously that's what we need to do, right? That's what that's what it is. What we, we said, that, just mind you, but just mind you, Tim. We yeah. did say that there are prophecies that say, uh, it, you know, it's not fitting for a prophet to die outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, yeah. have you killed the prophets? And this is the same, you know, judgment passed on in the Bible. So you can read word for word in the where, Bible where here what it says there. Under, so listen, that is a biblical argument. From, let me let me one hundred percent biblical. No, no. let me let me make yeah. my points. Let me make my points. Well, okay, John and I have listened quite a bit. If we want well, to get back on Antichrist, because I'm not an I'm not an expert on Charles, but on on this, somebody commented earlier. I mean, if, let, you talk. If, let me let <laughs> yeah. me make my points because this is a point I want to address okay. actually. All, All right. right, okay. So the original historical Babylon in history, you've got Babylon and Jerusalem, two separate cities, geographically separated, right? In the last days, when the two witnesses die on a street outside Jerusalem, Jerusalem is referred to as Sodom and Egypt. It is not referred to as Babylon. When we talk about Israel, Judea and Israel historically, and of course Israel today, unbelieving Israel, being harlots, you know, just like uh, Mystery Babylon, that's true, but they're like little harlots next to the big harlot, if you will. They're part of the tentacles. The city of Jerusalem, geographically, is not and cannot be Mystery Babylon. And when we look at the history of the literal Babylon of history, that literal Babylon turns into a heap of, you know, like a burning tar pit uh, that we read about in the land of Idumea in Isaiah in the Old Testament. That's what happens following Christ's return and in conjunction with it, the judgments that are coming. The literal Babylon of history will literally, more or less, cease to exist. That is not true of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is called the city of the great king, you know, of the Messiah. Yeah, and sits atop Mount Zion, which is the navel of the earth, biblically. Mystery Babylon will be casted down in Revelation, as we read about in Revelation 19. Jerusalem will not. Jerusalem gets split into three. The city does, Revelation 11, uh, you know, in a great earthquake that is close to, the, to Armageddon, not far from Armageddon, Armageddon happening. Jerusalem gets split in three. Later, the Mount of Olives gets split in two, and water and blood come out, you know, water initially. You know, uh, when Christ set, puts his feet on it and then when Armageddon happens, there's going to be blood all over the land, including in that split. There's a whole lot of symbolism and imagery around all that. But the point I want to make is it's improper and incorrect to call Jerusalem Mystery Babylon. And there are people who are trying to teach that. What is true and correct is that unbelieving Israel today are harlots. They're like, they're like chips off of the Babylonian block, if you will. They're part of those tentacles that are spread into the Holy Land. So that's the point that I want to make. Does that well, make I think, sense? I, yeah, I make no, it makes perfect sense. And I agree with you okay. to a certain extent. I do think that, I think, you know, obviously, in the way I believe, according to the word Jerusalem, there's going to be a new Jerusalem that comes down and the Shamayim of gold, the temple of gold that sits down over top of Jerusalem altogether. But, uh, you know, I, I and I and I'm not saying that they are the the harlot. They may or may not be, but there there's very much uh, biblical evidence to say there's no biblical evidence of that. And we're not, you know I think that that would be false. There to isn't say to call no. to call Jerusalem mystery Babylon. There's no evidence for that. So yes, how are you how are yes, you yes, how are you uh, discounting what Scott said about the scriptures? Yeah, actually, that, I didn't quote the scripture, but I can pull it up and quote yeah, it. Let's you. let's do that. Yeah, there, there is, is there is, it, is Jerusalem is never there. called Babylon in scripture. <laughs> Jerusalem is never called Babylon. No, no, no. But it's called spiritually Har Sodom, Sodom. Yes, spiritual and God Sodom. divorced. Yes, that's right. And God divorced Israel and Judea historically. No, he actually, harlotry. and can I just, can we be he, clear? He, did not I, he, he, he divorced Israel, but he did not, not divorce Judah. Judah. Uh, he, he, did he did ultimately because they... No, unified. he did not. There's no scriptural evidence that says that. When No, you're right. Well, not exactly. No, right. there's Jeremiah not. 15 and 16. <laughs> Jeremiah 15 and 16 are speaking not of Judea, and not Israel. Judah. Jeremiah 3 specifically says he, he divorced the house of Israel. Now, this is my wheelhouse as far as the, the yeah, Nazis. Yeah, well, he did not divorce Judah. I cover all this in great depth. Damn, in come on, man. At least let me talk answers. without cutting me off, yeah. okay? Hmm? Please? He divorced the, the house of Israel. He specifically mentions in Jeremiah 3 he did not divorce Judah. 
And the reason being is because Judah, unlike Ephraim, received the, the firstborn blessing, Judah did receive the royal blessing. Messiah came through Judah. So there was no divorce. Now, they were not out of covenant when Messiah came on. Now, obviously, we need to place our faith in Messiah. Jews that do not have that faith would be broken off branches. But there never was, at least I don't know of any scripture that, that specifically says that Yah, God, gave the house of Judah a certificate of divorce, which is exactly what it says in Jeremiah 3 and makes a distinction between the house of Judah. So if you yeah. know of a scripture mm -hmm. that says that, you know, and I'm just pushing back because I don't know of one. You're not going far enough in Jeremiah. So Jeremiah 3 is before the divorce of Judea. Jeremiah 3 is before Judea went into captivity in Babylon. When you get into Jeremiah 15 and 16, where it's addressing what happens to Judea subsequently, that's where you'll find that Judea also ultimately ends up divorced. The reason that Judea ended up in captivity with Israel. So initially you had Israel going to Assyrian captivity, right? Mm -hmm. Then Babylonia swallowed up Assyria mm -hmm. historically. Then Judea went into Babylonian captivity. So at that point, all 12 tribes were in Babylonian captivity. Correct. And Judah they were all divorced. I, I understand. I know. It doesn't they're say all, they're divorced, Tim. You're saying they're captured. They're all divorced at that point. That's the reason they were that. in captivity. Your eyes that that is the reason they were in captivity. <laughs> no. Well, we'll I'll come back to it with some passages of scripture for you later. Read <laughs> Jeremiah 15 and 16. And again, yep. for everybody on John's yeah. channel right now, Tim knew that, that and we've and me and John have asked a lot of questions about King Charles. Tim and I talk on the phone. We do not agree a lot. Tim knew coming on here that <laughs> my position, he, uh, we do this on the phone. Yeah. He's a big, by golly, he's a big boy. He can handle this. So this is how, when, and Tim and I actually, when we talk on the phone, this is how we'll engage. So I don't dislike Tim. I wouldn't have ha had him on my channel if I didn't yeah. like him as a person. We just differ on some things when it comes to scripture. And get, you know what, yeah. John? Iron That's sharpens okay. iron. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's yeah. okay. So, but anyway, Coming back to all of this, it's my view that Jerusalem is not Mystery Babylon at any time, but Mystery Babylon affects Jerusalem. Uh, and if we want to be you know, really literal to what Scripture actually says, you can say that Jerusalem becomes Sodom and Egypt spiritually. So that's what we can say. And of course, we know when the Lord comes, just as the literal Babylon of history ends up being a, a smoldering pit, more or less, in the land of Idumea, the the literal mystery Babylon on that particular city. And, and it's my view that it probably will be London, Rome, and New York alike, but that literal literal city will um, be cast down, you know, per Revelation 19, <clears throat> which is not what happens to Jerusalem. Interesting. Yeah, I want to say, too, there's a lot of people in the chat that's saying Scott isn't letting Tim talk, but Tim's been talking the whole time. Scott's just doing his job as an interview. So am I. I know that there's people who are going to, yeah. some people are going to love what Tim, love Tim. Some people are going to love Scott. Some people are going to love me. Hey, look, we're here, just all here trying to make something work, trying to figure out and, and test each other according to scripture. Be Bereans here. Uh, this is what it's all about. You know, if you can't be a Berean, if you can't, if things can't stand up to scripture, then we have to test them. This is what it's all about. This is the whole point of the show, I believe, is to test it because I've covered a lot of this in a show before when I actually covered the book Antichrist in a Cup of Tea before. A lot of the stuff that Tim talked about tonight, I actually said in the previous show. So it's not just to rehash that stuff. It's more mm -hmm. also just to test what he's got going on here because, look, you have to test things. If you don't test stuff, then you are you are a fool, plain and simple. You have to test everything that man says. Man is fallible 100%. Scripture is 100% right all the time. And if you can't test those things, if minds can't come together and sharpen each other, then, you know, this is the point of the show. This isn't, you know, this isn't like everybody pat each other on the back and, you know, give them kisses on the cheek all the time. This is, you know, men having discussions. This is what it ha this is how we do things. So, yeah. And hey, if the and only I, thing I, you ever have is yeah. an echo chamber, there's very little learning actually going on often. Yeah. Of I, I do exactly. have a question yeah. for you about Charles. I'll yes. bring it back to Charles. Do you believe uh -huh. that he will set up? his his world governing system in jerusalem do you believe he would no. ultimately move so just a statue just abomination of desolation he'll set it down but he'll his power base would stay in london uh new york 
I think. Now, okay. now that's not to say that it's impossible for the United Nations, for example, to be moved to Jerusalem or to be supplanted by some new setup in Jerusalem, right? If that were to happen, that would change my viewpoint, but not entirely, because the one thing that I have to say is, you know, Babylon, Mystery Babylon gets cast down. But Jerusalem in Isaiah chapter 4 and Malachi chapter 4, at the end of the tribulation week, instead of being cast down, gets raised up atop Mount Zion, which becomes a giant mountain in the earth, the exact opposite of what happens to Mystery Babylon. So for them to be the same city would, in my view, present a contradiction there as well. What about the two-thirds of Israel uh, being destroyed in the, in the end time prophecy could that not signify a similar and it actually talks about it being destroyed with like fire and stuff right i mean so could that not signify um that um event no because the uh the when i say in the land of Idumea, that's a geographic location in iraq so <clears throat> and that's prophesied in isaiah and when we talk about well, well hold what on happens a second. you're Israel, saying just, just mm -hmm. say go back to say that again what okay Idumea is a is a Position, but what, what, what does that have to do with uh, the idea of two thirds being destroyed in Israel in Jerusalem? Well, you're asking me if the fire by which or means by which they're destroyed in Jerusalem is somehow related to to the, the fire of, of Babylonia. Ba I think yes, Mr. Yeah, that's what I was asking. Yeah, yeah but that's what so, I think you're asking. That's what I'm asking. So, what is that? Uh, what I'm what I'm saying is, what does that have to do with it, Amaya? I guess it doesn't. Okay. So, so when we talk about the two thirds, that's in Zechariah chapters twelve to fourteen, and also Ezekiel chapter six, I believe five and six. So, <clears throat> two thirds of Israel, and it's not really Israel; it's two thirds of those who are in Judea, will die. And most of Israel's Jewish population today, modern nation state of Israel, is in the territory of Judea. Most of it, the bulk of it. Okay. So, two thirds of those who remain in Judea, and this is during the Great Tribulation, so not. Armageddon, not when Mystery Babylon gets cast down, which is, you know, in conjunction with right before Armageddon. This is before that. So in the Great Tribulation itself, when the Temple Mount area is being trampled underfoot by the nations, you know, and half of Jerusalem has been taken captive in war, we read in Zechariah 12 to 14 that, for example, in Jerusalem, the women will be raped, the houses rifled, uh, captives carried away as far as Babylon in Iraq. This is the ancient Babylon of history, in other words, not mystery Babylon, but carried away as far as Babylon in Iraq. So a new Babylonian captivity, if you will, to the literal Babylon of history, which Saddam Hussein had been rebuilding in Iraq before he was killed, just like he'd been rebuilding the city of Nineveh. Not everyone knows that. But um, so there is a literal city of Babylon in Iraq today and uh, the, the original one. And so there will be Israelites carried away as far as Babylon and Iraq. But in conjunction with all of that, those who remain in Judea throughout the period of the Great Tribulation, and this is the same period in which Charles as the Antichrist will be riding as the fourth horseman, you know, and his name will be death. Two thirds of Israel in Judea will die. And that's the same period in which the two witnesses will be testifying. At the end of that period of the great tribulation when the nation of israel turns to christ in faith to messiah in faith to yeshua and becomes saved right before armageddon at that point the lord will encircle jerusalem literally with a wall of fire you know it, whether it's spiritual lit or literal we'll have to wait and see but i assume it's both but he'll encircle jerusalem with a wall of fire and he will protect israel in that manner in a similar way to when he put the veil between the Egyptians who were pursuing Israel at the Exodus and Israel so that the Egyptians couldn't continue to pursue them. Another good example would be Elisha uh, when uh, mm -hmm. the Syrian army was, was heading camped around the, the village and uh, the servants freaking out when he wakes up that morning and, and Elisha says, don't worry about it, man. There's, there's more with us than against us. And then he prays that, that Yah would open his eyes and he sees the, the chariot. So, so there are definitely no doubt if we just believe our scriptures, there can be supernatural protection uh, that that's yes. occurring during this great tribulation period. But hey, Tim, I've got I'm gonna put post. Uh, I think it'll show up. Uh, so Brenda, who's one of my Facebook friends, asks. Uh, she's quoting Revelation seventeen eleven. John says the beast once was and now is not. Is the eighth? How would Charles be the beast who once who once was and be one of the seven? So I'll let, I'll just uh, hang up and listen to your response to that. 
I'm going to say get the book on that one because that's a complicated answer. I go into it in a lot of detail, actually, in the book. And in fact, John would have read about that in the first edition. Uh, there are multiple ways to interpret that, but they all still come down to Charles as the Antichrist. And it isn't just, you know, is the eighth and is of the seventh. There are also seven mountains. You know, there are multiple pieces of imagery brought together in the prophecy. Uh, you know, people look at Rome, you know, the city on seven hills or seven mountains, historically, you know, in connection with all of that. I think the more important part of that to actually address here is where people talk about the beast coming out of the bottomless pit and going into perdition. People have looked at that and said, well, the Antichrist, you know, or Satan or whomever rises out of the bottomless pit. So Charles can't be the Antichrist, right? There are people who've tried to make that argument. And I've seen that online because they confuse what the meaning is there. But, but perdition is a reference to the Antichrist. He's the son of perdition biblically in terms of going to or into perdition in that prophecy. It's basically another possession of Charles as the Antichrist is what it's talking about from either a fallen angel or a set of demons or a demon that comes out of the bottomless pit. In this case, it's the angel uh, of the bottomless pit, you know, if I remember right. But it's, it's this thing that comes out of the bottomless pit and goes into perdition. In this case, it's referring to another possession of Charles as the son of perdition. You know, and he's called the son of perdition in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, like Judas, who was possessed by Satan. So I'm hearing some someone's mic. Uh, that, I, I was just trying to get, I, I wanted to, somebody had pointed mm -hmm. out on, John, on John's channel in chat about the owl. Uh, maybe, maybe we'll get back to, uh, like, I, th I think it was the concert after the coronation. Uh, you, you probably have the slide you can pull up that shows that owl in the sky at the concert. I don't know if I have a slide of that that I can pull up easily. Let me see. If I do, I just forget where it is. That's all. I probably do. Not sure if it's one that I grabbed yet. But I might have. Um, I haven't grabbed that yet, but I do know what they're talking about. They showed an owl toward the end of the coronation concert. And that was another unique thing about the coronation. There was never a concert before or after the coronation, ever. That was unique to Charles. And they were pushing the eco-fascism and so forth there. And they had multiple symbols that were occult the owl being a primary one. So I've got, I've got At one more concert. question. It's getting, it's getting late boys for me. It's a uh, 11 o'clock central time here. Mm -hmm. We've been going since eight 15. Now I've got one last <laughs> question to get in mm -hmm. that. I want to, yes. I just want to get in. So your book's very compelling and it's also super expensive on Amazon. I've noticed, is there another place that people can get your book where they're not paying $300 for the book? Yeah. You know, a lot of people say that, but they don't understand that they're looking at the old edition, the original one, the 1998 edition on Amazon. Okay. That's not the new edition. I tried the to new explain edition. that in chat earlier. <laughs> that that, that yeah. was the Amazon reseller, not the new book. Okay. Yeah. Because that's the one I saw. Was, I was like, oh my gosh, $300. I was like, David, you got a copy. He's like, and I was like, oh my God, thank goodness. I didn't have to pay 300 So yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah. The original edition is um, a collector's item at this point. And I've seen it going, you know, 300 is cheap compared to prices I've seen. Uh, I've seen it going for 500, 600, up to $1,800, which is crazy, right? Uh, yeah. But it, it's yeah. because it's a collector's item. People and, in chat. Uh, it's no longer Tim, in print. Tim, yeah. you're not the reseller of these. These are like book resellers that have the book and put them up on Amazon, correct? Oh, ones. yeah, I don't. <laughs> no, I, I don't. Yeah, I suppose I could, but no, I've never <laughs> sold one like that ever. <laughs> You know, if All people right, so, want to spend so where do you, that, God you bless them, go do it and preserve it for future generations. Somebody needs to do it. <laughs> so remind me, where do you get them now? Uh, Prophecy House. So prophecyhouse.com. Prophecy That's my publisher. Okay. That's where all of my books and materials are available and a whole lot more to come, including the book on the Mark of the Beast, the Last Days Polemic, the Depopulation Agenda book, the book on the Exodus from Ancient Egypt, my book, North Korea Ran in the Coming World War. You can get that uh, right now. That's out. Uh, on that deals with the second seal on prophecy as a site and then various cd and dvd sets which are still current uh all of them so and there's a lot more to come a whole lot more one more question that i have is yeah. if okay so charles is old he's an old man right now he, he is near his 
latter years possibly i mean who knows my grandma lived to be like 100 plus years old he could live you know another whatever 20 30 years but if he dies before this takes place do you consider that the him the deadly head wound or are you going to say i was wrong if he dies um during your lifetime while you were still alive and i know you don't believe it's going to happen there's no way in your mind that 100 percent god to showed you and i respect that but um if this does happen then what all right so we talked about how this label of the eldest son identifies things pertaining specifically to charles on this first beast imagery right Yes, sir. And how it has an overall head. So the corporate beast represents Charles himself. When we look at the prophecy about the head wound, and this is something that for odd reasons, I'll say most people somehow managed to miss. But uh, when we look at the wound, it says, and I saw one of his heads as if it was mortally wounded. So the beast has multiple heads, plural, not just one head. And one of its heads, one of his heads is mortally wounded, right? And when we look at the heraldic achievement, the coat of arms, it has multiple heads all over it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, here, well, just a bunch of them. But specific ones represent Charles. But the overall heraldic achievement also represents Charles. So my opinion is that rather than it being someone who's one of Charles' minions, you know, receiving a fatal wound, it'll be Charles himself who receives the fatal wound, and it'll be at that point with his recovery from the same that Satan possesses him. I think that those things will go together, and I'm expecting Charles to seem to have died or to have received a wound that's so severe that the world will say there's no way to recover from that, so that when he does you know, suddenly recover, it's considered so strange or odd to the world that they start to worship him and follow after him like what Revelation, Revelation 13 is describing. And in terms of his age, I want to make two points. One is, and you you alluded to it, pardon me, that um, his parents, you know, he, it does, he could live decades longer ostensibly, but his mother and father, Prince Philip and Queen Elizabeth II, both lived decades beyond Charles' current age. Yeah. And the queen was on the throne until her death. So you can argue quite easily that Charles being fit could live into his 90s from that. Today, you know, he's about to turn um, 75. November 14th this year, he'll turn 75. You could argue he's got another 20 years in him, you know, if the Lord doesn't come back from that alone because of his parents. Setting that aside, a lot of people will say, well, Charles can't be it because he's too old. Christ started his ministry at the age of 30. The Antichrist is going to be about 30 or, or he's going to be 30 when he starts his ministry, right? You know, I heard it from my pastor or that kind of thing. Well, first of all, this is another one of those things kind of like Charles isn't a homosexual. He likes women, so he can't be the Antichrist. This is as incorrect, the argument on the age, you know, that he's got to be about 30 as what I illustrated earlier in relation to that prophecy in Daniel, Daniel 11, uh, verse 37. Charles is a homosexual, so he meets the tradition, if you want to call it that way, even though, pro even though that particular prophecy isn't actually about him as the Antichrist. But coming back to this thing on the age, what Luke actually says when it says he began his ministry at about 30, right? That's how our English translations render the Greek usually. That's not what the Greek text says. The Greek text actually has a very different meaning. The Greek text says he began his ministry as if 30 years of age. In other words, their tradition was that someone would start their ministry as an adult if they were going to do ministry at about the age of 30. That was the tradition. You know, that was what was typical to see in first century Israel. But because the Greek text says as if, it's also telling us, well, Christ, Yeshua, was actually not 30 years old. But he began his ministry in that tradition as if he were 30 years old. And the thing that clarifies it further is that later in the Gospel of John, they say to Yeshua, you are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? They didn't say to him, you are not yet 40. They said to him, you are not yet 50. So in other words, he could have been in his early 40s or seemed to have been when they said that to him. They didn't say "You're not." he's not yet 40. So... 
we cannot, from that perspective, pin down Christ's actual age when he began his ministry. He could very easily have been considerably older than 30. That's the first point. The second one is that isn't even a criteria for identifying the Antichrist biblically anywhere. The age of this individual who's going to be over a global government is nowhere indicated in Scripture. To try to say that because Christ was 30 or about 30, you know, even if you accept the fact that he was 30 when really he could have been considerably older than that, if that's your view, to try to say that therefore the Antichrist must be 30 years old or about 30 when he starts his ministry is a false uh, equivocation and uh, or a false yeah, equation. I, I, I put the question equating. up because that wasn't John's question. I'm not, I'm, I'm going to press you. Uh, right Sorry, now. I didn't if, see your question. If, no, 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 if he dies and he stays in the grave yeah. for a month, or three months or a year, would you, All right. at that point in time, would you still think he's going to get resurrected? Probably not, but that isn't going to happen. Okay. Yeah, that was my question ultimately, but I do agree with you. He could live a lot. He could live longer. I know people live, you know, people that have. He's got, he's got good, uh, he's got good long genes too, John. <laughs> he does. He's got good <laughs> genetics. He's got good <laughs> genetics. I was just asking, cause I want to know, cause I was, I was thinking, I'm like, you know what? I could set up a good bet here. Like, okay, if I'm, if I'm wrong, if I'm wrong, or if you're wrong, uh, maybe me and Scott get a, a, a you know, a, you know, $20,000, you know, stifing a piece or something like that, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I kind of like that. Cause if I'm right, I could use the money. I can use it to get the book out more. Let's, let's do that. <laughs> what do you want to oh, put man. up for that? <laughs> oh man. No, I, I don't know, man. I, who knows if I'll live as long as King Charles does, uh, to be honest with you. That dude, he's got good genetics. So, you know, uh, my goodness. But, yeah, I'm, I'm just – I'm excited, man, to see what happens. I, I'm the kind of person that really – I truly believe that even though I've heard it from generations, you know, we're living in the end times, we're living in the end times, I truly believe, like, you know, all everything is lining up, all the technology, everything is lining up to where there could actually be a one-world government. There could actually be – one ruler over everybody, one currency. And so the books like what you wrote here um, and your insight into this seems very unique to me. Uh, I, I just want to say that. And I, I, I enjoyed it a lot. And I really do Thank believe you. that if it's not the, if he is not the antichrist, it's probably the best shot that I've ever seen on it. No doubt by far i just want to say that uh before we get off here tim and i i, I do you. appreciate you writing and putting a lot of work into that stuff and, and although we would disagree on several topics i think ultimately i agree with you 100 percent that the lineage uh, in fact what i would agree with you on is not something you would even say but i agree that the lineage has to come out of that 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 bloodline um and before you even knew that you knew that the antichrist was king charles so that's pretty interesting but i i already knew that the bloodline had to be that bloodline so when i read your book it was just icing on the cake i guess you could say and in fact it had more of the ingredients of the cake than i had planned it was really good hey, you know one more point on that bloodline what? Uh, what, real, Tim, quick, Tim, one, let me real quick yeah. Yeah, and then ahead. i'll let you close this out because john says he's getting sleepy he's got kids oh, so, man, he's yeah. kids. <laughs> so but but in in this I think this is a fascinating, interesting topic. That's the reason I, uh, Tim came on mine and Doug Hamp's little prophecy roundtable where we literally did like a discussion, debate. Doug and I don't even always agree. Quite often we don't agree. But really, who the Antichrist is, and, uh, and we're closing this out because we all believe that the Bible is, is God, the word of God is whether Tim's correct, and he believes he is, whether whether John and I, who are somewhat not skeptical per se, but, but we're not 100% convinced and dogmatic as Tim is, what really matters is we place our faith in Yeshua, in Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. and that we repent. Because it doesn't matter ultimately if Tim, Tim, you, you may be 100% correct, but if someone doesn't have true faith, if they haven't repented and put their faith in the Messiah, the Mashiach, Yeshua, uh, Jesus of Nazareth. You know, I don't do sacred name stuff, but that's the ultimate thing. And, and again, I wanted to have this conversation to to because I knew John's audience would really love it. And he has a much, much larger audience than me. I don't, I don't do this full time. I'm, I, I'm just a lawyer, but that's the reason I wanted to have his own. But John, anything else before we let Tim close us out for the last minute or two? 
No, man, I, I just want to say thank you, both of you, for um, allowing this. And this is something, you know, that I've been studying for a very long time. And I know a lot of people um, may not, you know, really respect what's been said tonight by any of us. But I would say that, you know, no matter what, there ha there's no doubt in my mind that um, the research that's been done here is commendable. There's no doubt about that. I mean, you could say whatever you want. Every, you know, everybody's a, an expert in their own right, and everybody oh. believes they know every thing, and everybody believes that this person knows this, this person knows everything. But I mean, when it comes down to it, you know, like if you can get your information out there and you can present it in a way that is um, biblical, and I think you've done a good job of most of the stuff in your book presented in a way that lines up biblically. I just I want to say that you're not claiming to be a prophet from what I understand. You're not claiming to be prophesy exactly what's going to happen. Um, but you have written information that we can glean from and look at and say, okay, this is a real possibility because ultimately what the reason this matters so much is because whoever the antichrist will be, will be deceiving millions, if not billions of individuals that are left here on the earth. There will be a deception so great many will not be able to turn their head from it. It said even the elect will be deceived if it were possible. So it's important to have your finger on this idea because a lot of people are, love Charles, whether or not people in America like him so much, who knows. But a lot of people love the guy. A lot of people look him as a savior. He looks at himself as a savior. Uh, he has the purse strings to be able to, to solve the world's hunger, to be able to solve probably the pandemic because he's probably behind it. He's got the war, he's got all of those things. And, and so we need to be really clear that when there, a man pops up and claims this lineage and he has these lineages that look like he should be the Messiah. And in fact, he's going to seem righteous, right? The Bible says that the devil comes as an angel of light, right? His servants transform into angels of light to, to, to deceive people. So we need to be ready for that. And this is just another idea to look at. You know, everybody has their opinions, but I can tell you so far, nobody's opinions have been 100% right on, on this subject, but this is unique, man. This could be a historical moment for me to be able to interview Tim. And, and if he's right, you know, this is going to be, this is something that um, is going to be so, a big step for you guys ahead, or ahead of the game. So a lot of people are going to be deceived. And I'll say this, John, just real quick, because I do watch your uh, your channel. I, I do watch you and David. I don't always agree with y'all. But once you start going public like this and you start discussing things, and, and that's where I, I, I admire Tim for his confidence. Uh, but once you start doing this, it's so much easier to sit sit behind your keyboard and flash out this stuff and, and, and right. call, call a brother or, you know, just... And again, m most of your audience is very well respectful, but there's always a few. And it's just so easy to to be dogmatic. But when you start doing it publicly, and I've only been doing this three or four years, and again, I'm not in full time ministry, you get to be more a little more gracious quite often in a different understanding that, that a brother might have. Oh, yeah. Especially when you talk about it publicly, you have to be you can't like eventually you're going to be like, dang, I was so dogmatic about that and like dude here i'm in 10 years later and i don't agree with anything i just said on that broadcast so when you do broadcasts and you write things you can't be you can't always be dogmatic but to be dogmatic like tim is on this subject it, it takes it takes guts is that what you're trying to say yeah i mean again i, I tim i like I, I jokingly have told tim this but but on this topic and, I, and when it comes to this he, he even makes me appear humble sometimes, which is very hard to do if you know me, John. You know, we've talked all about, but, but just on this topic now. But we, when we, when me and him get going on the phone and discussing prophecy, I mean, we're it was sort of like that that five minutes, you know, where where he knows I don't, I'm not disliking him. I'm just I'm an animated person, <laughs> so even now when I'm talking, I'm, I'm I'm more animated than your average person. You guys are more cerebral. Uh, <laughs> So more, 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 you know, except my posture is always sitting back in the chair, but uh, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. It was, it was fun to me to talk about this and, and just... Tim close this out, man. So John can go to bed and, and yeah, my okay. wife. <laughs> yeah. So I love iron sharpening iron. I'm going to answer a couple things here at the end and I'll close this out. I'm going to share my screen though, again, for a moment. Is that all right? Sure. Let me, uh, let me pull it up, Tim. Okay. It should. Yeah, add a stream. Okay, there we go. All right. First thing I want to show is this. Uh, 
I made this available to a few people already, but if anybody wants the message of salvation, it's at the back of my books. This is what's at the back of the North Korea Iran and the coming World War book. This is more meaty than what is put out by most um, pastors even on what's required biblically to be saved. So this goes into the passages and references them and really lays it out clearly from scripture. Anybody can have this who wants it. Um, I'll probably you know post it as a download on Prophecy site, make sure it gets up there so people can just come and grab this to share with others. But if there's anyone listening and you don't know what's required scripturally to be saved and know that you are saved, you'll find the answer in this, which will point you to the scriptures. You can follow this and follow along in scripture and it'll answer your questions on that. So I do offer that and that's at the back of every one of my books. And then uh, John, uh, well, actually before I do that, let me just point out again where people can get my stuff. Yeah, that'll that'll confuse people. Um, yeah. So Prophecy House is my publisher. This is where people can go and get for a reasonable price. Uh, the second edition, the new edition of the Antichrist and the Cup of Tea. And I do offer a lineage chart with it, which shows the British monarchy's official claim to sit upon King David's throne. Now, we didn't get into the coronation entirely, but one point that needs to be made is that Israel's president, Isaac Herzog, was present for Charles' coronation. The chief rabbi, so-called, of the United Kingdom participated in Charles' coronation. Both those individuals are tied in with the, the uh, leading rabbis, so-called, of the United Kingdom uh, and Israel. They're, they're all tied together. So for Isaac Herzog and um, Charles, Isaac, Isaac Herzog, and then these this chief rabbi of the UK and so forth to have participated like they did and to have attended means there was approval, if you will, in the rabbinic community in Israel of what was done. And Charles was crowned King of Israel on May 6th though most of the public doesn't know that. That was done. He wasn't crowned only king of the United Kingdom or England or those Commonwealth nations that accept him as their monarch. Furthermore, and this is in the second edition of the book, one of the reasons its publication was delayed a little bit, uh, the rabbinic community, some of them in Israel, have prepared a gold crown and a Torah scroll to present to the Messiah when he visits from abroad. They prepared this years ago. Charles is planning to visit um, the United Kingdom soon, maybe this year. Or excuse me, Israel. Thank you. Israel, yes, Israel. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so he's planning to visit. There. There's every possibility, you know, and I, I mentioned in the first edition of my book that it was announced on national television in, in Israel that Charles is a descendant of King David more than once. This is back in 1998. That had already been announced. There have been more announcements since. So that means the rabbinic community is actively looking at the British monarchy as being the source of the Messiah, most likely. Now that the monarchy would come along and show an official lineage, which is available with the book, that's why I showed that on Prophecy site, Queen Elizabeth II's official lineage published in London, which makes the claims explicitly on it. Now that uh, he's been crowned, and there's a male monarch instead of a female monarch, you know, in the days that the nation state of Israel has been reconstituted. Israel, for the first time, the rabbinic community there can say, okay, where's the Messiah? And I believe that they are looking at Charles as that individual, you know, apart from um, some individual who is ostensibly doing miracles and that kind of thing in the ultra-Orthodox community there in Israel, you know, as, as an anti-Messiah. But um, I think we'll see Charles probably in the not too distant future, but time will tell. Go to Israel, maybe be given that gold crown, maybe be given that Torah scroll. Maybe when Israel decides they've got a red heifer, actually sacrifice that red heifer himself, acting in a priestly capacity. And Charles has this weird title, which uh, a lady who has a, who puts out interesting things on Charles, been following him for decades and, and my work also. 
she put out an interesting thing recently noting that Charles has a title, which is like something to the effect of, and I, and I don't quote me on this, but something to the effect of King of the Weeping Cows. <laughs> Weird title. But yeah. yeah. So we can talk another time about quote unquote aliens, about the coronation, you know, get into that. We didn't really get to do that today, but we got into a little bit. And, uh, and what's coming in Israel. There's an awful lot that I understand of things that are coming in Israel that you won't hear from other Bible teachers because they don't know scripture in the way that I do. But I will point one thing out, one last thing here. When you were talking about me not claiming to be a prophet, that's true. I don't claim that. Never have. However, there is a caveat. And here it is. Um, The person who correctly identifies the Antichrist for the church ahead of time, and I'm not the only one. Monty Judah did that also, you know, but not, he didn't write the book and so forth. I'm the one God chose to write the book, as it were. But the person who does that for the, the actual Antichrist correctly in history, by definition, has understanding of Scripture. And that's the reason God has called me to write all sorts of other books that bring all kinds of understanding of scripture and biblical history to bear that either isn't well understood or in some cases not known, like what's actually out in our solar system and putting it in a biblical context as a young earth creationist taking scripture literally. So I'll just leave it at that. So I don't claim to be a prophet. What I do claim is to understand the prophets. So that's the distinction that I make. Well, I mean, I think everybody that teaches the Bible would hope to under, say to understand them a little bit. Am I right? I mean, I would hope Everyone I would hope should. that if you're yeah, if you're trying to push eschatology, I think that it's important. I mean, are there any points, though, that you feel like you're like, OK, I'm not 100 percent sure on this. This is uh, there's a possibility that I could be in this wrong point right here. Uh, or do you think you got it all figured out 100%? I, I'll yeah, answer that one. first. I know I don't have it all figured out. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah, there is one, and it got me into some hot water actually with my children. Uh, you know, when in 1987, I'm going to go back before I had children. In 1987, when God showed me who the Antichrist was, here Charles was already an adult male, already called the most eligible bachelor in the world, you know, already popular throughout the world, already running the world, you know, behind the scenes, me not knowing that yet, but knowing how popular he was, that he was old enough already to take on the role of the Antichrist and being known to everyone in the world, basically. So I thought, okay, here we are, 1987, God shows me who the Antichrist is. He's ready to go. That's what I thought, right? So I didn't think we had that long before the tribulation week would begin and Armageddon would occur. And then we've had all these false starts over the decades, right? Where it looked like this could be it, this could be it, this could be it, and then it hasn't happened yet. And right now, as we're speaking, there are people out there who know that Charles is the Antichrist, uh, who are putting out some good information on him. Most of it's good, not all of it, but we're putting out some good information on him and who at the same time are saying, but I'm a pre-tribulationist. You know, and... And one of them is even predicting that the tribulation week will begin this year. Apparently, that's how he comes across. Oh, that he's saying it'll begin are. around COP twenty-eight. Yeah, many are. I'm speaking of one though, who's who's out there, know, you know, promoting know, Charles as the Antichrist. And unless those folks come around, they're going to get egg on their face. They're going to find out. No, whoops, I was wrong. The church is going through the tribulation week entirely, and then the great tribulation within that week, the latter half. I have always been clear that we're going to go through the great tribulation. I've always been clear that Charles is the Antichrist never wavered for a moment on any of that. But where I have struggled is the timing because, and I'm looking at the timing, John, from the perspective of knowing that the millennial kingdom begins at the end of the year, 6,000 biblically. That's when it starts. So the tribulation week ends at that point. We can add up the years in scripture and know that we're close to the Lord's return on that basis alone. And I've actually done a complete volume, and it was finished in the early 1990s, more or less finished, in the uh, Messiah History and the Tribulation Period series, an entire biblical chronology. I actually did one. And I'm the only chronologist I know of in history, you know, in the church, 
to have successfully uh, harmonized all the regencies and co-regencies of Israel's and Judea's kings and their sons without inventing co-regencies and so forth that aren't stated in scripture and inserting those into the chronology. I'm the only one who's ever been able to harmonize that. And I did it by recognizing one thing, and that's converting certain periods of years specified in scripture to their solar year equivalents. So that's in my chronology. I mention that because I've also got a mathematical margin of error in that chronology, things nobody else has ever even attempted to do in a biblical chronology. And with all of that, I cannot be accurate enough to know precisely when we're going to reach the end of the year 6,000. And so there have, because of that mathematical margin of error and some other unknowns, and for that reason, I've looked at these things that have been happening, you know, like Trump, you know, when it looked like we were going to perhaps have war break out with North Korea, when Trump was saying, I've got a big red button too, more or less, right? Toward Kim Jong-un and launching nuclear missiles and this kind of thing. I thought, well, you know, gee, could we be nearing the second year of the tribulation week? Because I associate those wars with the second year. Uh, could we be in it yet? I, there have been multiple things that have happened that made me wonder. But to this point in time, I don't think we're in that week yet. I don't think the tribulation period has begun, but I think we're very, very close. But I got myself in hot water with my children because I th said to them when they were younger, you know, I'm not sure. I don't think you're going to be old enough one day to, you know, go to college, marry, have children of your own, because I think we don't have that long to the Lord's coming back. But at the same time, I was a post-tribulationist, never wavered on Charles as the Antichrist or those kinds of things. So, yes, at some point I'm going to be proven wrong, and I have been, on when I thought it would start. I thought it would start sooner than it actually is going to. Hmm. So now, have you read end. have you read any Fominko or Vilikowski by chance about when it comes to time period times and and um, the the um, I guess the theories that they have on the time post Jesus have you read any of those theories that because I I'm just asking because no. I think that it might be inter no. of interest to you trying to put together a timeline it might be of interest because. The theory of uh, Fominko was a Russian, um, he was a professor, PhD, and Vilikovsky as well. But they believed in a phantom time hypothesis dealing with the Dark Ages. And I would, I, I used to think that was the stupidest thing. But then the more I started uh, researching, you know, specifically in the 1600s, I, I start, started to give them a little bit of possibly you know compelling evidence that this is the case because there's a lot of written mythology in that time but there's not a lot of a lot of archaeology to back up the um what is being said in those time periods especially for the kings of england which is interesting because the pin dragons were the last dragon kings and you you were talking about the you were talking about the dragon kings or the last red dragon but uh, right after that this is when we have arthur taking place taking his throne um, but there's a suggestion that there's missing several hundred years missing, if not a thousand years missing or not missing, I'm sorry, but added to the record. Uh, have you come in contact with any of that stuff? This, these are Russian historians, by the way. Well, so all my research is firsthand. Uh, I will say two things in relation to that. Israel's rabbinic community, which is obviously not honest, or they would believe that Yeshua is the Messiah has a missing time period of over two centuries in their chronology. They're saying we're in the year 57, whatever. About it's very easy to show. Yeah, it's very easy to show biblically and from multiple other chronologies, you know, from the first century on that we are nearing the year 6,000 scripturally. And I agree, I agree with that. But if you the scripture to say otherwise. I see. Yeah. I agree with that to a certain extent, but I believe so. I believe well, I'm, I'm I, getting to your I believe point, in a literal right? thousand year reign. So I just to kind of give you an idea, I believe in yeah. a literal thousand year reign, but not a reign on earth because Jesus said, okay. I'm going to rule at the right hand of my father. Uh, I'm a uh, rule and or you'll sit here at my right hand until I make your name as your footstool and all of this stuff. So I believe that we're possibly exactly uh, close to either 2000 or 1000 years from the time that Yeshua was crucified on earth um what do you think on that on that as far as like how long has it been since the crucifixion are you on, with that idea that it's been a, almost exactly two thousand years or depending on if you believe in the phantom time hypothesis which i know you're almost two thousand years yeah. yes almost two thousand years 2, exactly years. right 2033 almost. is that what you believe or 2030 is that what you believe well, uh, again i i'm dealing with math mathematical margin of error so i'm not comfortable saying it's going to be 2030 or 2034 but 
I will say that it's very, very close. And personally, personal opinion, my feeling is we probably don't have 10 years left to Armageddon, but we might have 10 years, 11 years, 12 years, we might have nine, but it's going to be soon. And we'll see the tribulation week start very soon if we're not already about to enter it. So that's, that's been yeah. my understanding since I, my, my dad wrote a book on uh, on it back in the 70s about about it. The, it's actually called the seven times seven plan of God. And it's about this this prophecy. And, and this is before he got um, got off in the weeds with dispensationalism and kind of when he was just studying the Bible as an early Christian. He saw this and he didn't even realize that that this that the, the rabbis had taught about the Messiah would come after after four days and then there'd be a two day messianic period followed by a one day Shabbat rest and this prophecy and everything. And he had no idea because he didn't have the Internet back in the 70s that this was something that was well taught. And I know what John, but John and I have actually discussed that, uh, that they're you know, that we can't necessarily trust the history books. And I don't trust secular history. But if it's oh, only well, off a year, let me finish Tim. If it's only off uh, a year or two, that's and Tim and I had this discussion earlier today that I believe we're somewhere between year since since Yeshua returned to his place from Hosea. Uh, I believe we're somewhere between one point nine eight nine days to one point nine nine five ish or nine six ish days. But but I wouldn't be dogmatic on that at all. I, I, you know, so that that's my understanding to that question. All right, so I'm going to say two things. Um, one is the book of Hebrews, whoever wrote it, and I think it was probably Paul, but whoever wrote it. Uh, by mentioning that it remains for us to enter a Sabbath rest in the context Hebrews of God's four. kingdom. Yeah, Hebrews 4, in the context of God's kingdom, is affirming, in my view, the traditional rabbinic understanding of biblical history being seven millennia, or seven 1,000 year days in length with the seventh 1,000 year period being the Sabbath millennium. So I think Hebrews 4 is speaking to that and basically affirming that in the New Testament. The second point is, John, do you're missing millennium? There is one in chronology, but I don't know if it ties into the authors about whom you asked and what they're saying. I will tell you what I know, and I address this in my book on chronology and I address it in my Messiah history and the tribulation period series. And I may have mentioned it in a couple of interviews in the past too. And that is that um, the chronology that was being followed by the anti-Nicene church, the church of the first few centuries was based on the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. And that chronology was off by, um, you know, basically, 1500 years. So they thought that they were reaching the year 6,000 early in the sixth century AD. And for that reason, when you get into the fifth and sixth centuries, like the late fifth century, uh, their writings, and even before that, their writings are indicating that they thought that the Lord's return and his kingdom wouldn't be that far off, you know, hi historically speaking. And that's because they actually thought they were approaching the sixth millennium 1500 years earlier then it was actually going to occur. Later on, the Protestants in the Protestant Reformation went back to the Hebrew scriptures and the biblical chronology from the Hebrew scriptures and started to look toward the, two, the uh, year 2000 because they were no longer looking at the chronology in the Septuagint, which was off by about 1500 years. So, you know, and that's the point at which they started to look toward um, our day as likely the time frame in which the millennial kingdom would arrive. Very good. Well, I, I'm not going to ask him more questions because I could just keep going on. And and before you know it, I'll be asleep here on the mic. But I love I really enjoyed it, man. I, I appreciate both of you guys for, for, for doing this. Great. And my wife's calling me right now. Thanks, so, uh, <laughs> hey, guys, uh, it was a pleasure having both of you on. Hey, John, thanks yeah. for co-hosting on your channel as well. And everybody have a blessed evening. OK, thank All you, right, and John. Guys. Please, John, please point people to Prophecy House's site when you post it. Prophecy See, House, uh, it is okay. And it, just so you know, it is live on YouTube right now as we're speaking. So prophecyhouse.com, and I, uh, if you go to YouTube, type in NYS TV, you can find it, or you can go to 
Scott's channel. What is your channel, Scott? I guess if they're it's listening, just, they found it, right? My, so. <laughs> it's just my name, man. So. All right. Scott Harwell. Yeah. All right. I, and mine also, author Tim Cohen. Author, yep. And you have to type in author Tim Cohen because if you don't, you will not. I even typed in Antichrist and a cup of tea, Tim Cohen, and I found one interview. Uh, and it was the original interview that I ended up finding. And the rest of them are buried, man. You've been buried in, in the algorithm. I know what that's like. Doesn't feel I good. have, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Doesn't feel All good. Right. I'm going to end the broadcast now. All right, guys. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Guys. God bless.